Hello and welcome to a Conquest the Last Argument of Kings event list analysis. Conquer Canberra is a community organised world qualifier event coming up on 13th to 14th of July in Canberra ACT with players travelling from all across the country including from Western Australia, the legends, and list submission closed on Sunday evening. The event organiser Tom has been good enough to take all of the lists and put them up online which we will link in the video description below. But because all of the lists are out there now, they are public, we're taking this opportunity to go through and talk about all of them, all 23 of them from all of the registered players. Now to note, this will be a little bit of an opportunity to talk in brief about each of these lists, a snapshot of how at least parts of Australia are playing Conquest at the moment, but we're not going to really, really deep dive into every list. The reasons for this are twofold. The first is that there are 23 of these lists. That's a lot of lists, and I will run out of voice eventually. But then secondly, obviously, I am not the player of all of these lists. I have an idea of how many of them will play, and I can make some commentary about those, but ultimately only the players know how these have been designed and what they're meant to do. So I will try and offer some insight, but ultimately this is for entertainment and for a bit of a snapshot in how Australia is currently playing Conquest the Last Argument of Kings. Now, we are grouping our lists today by factions, which means we're starting with the city-states. Of the 23 players at Conquer Canberra, five of them are playing city-states, which is the most city-states players I think I've heard of attending an event in Australia, which is awesome. Obviously, there have been some new releases for city-states over the last sort of like six months that have had a pretty significant impact on the faction. And I suspect that's been the impetus for at least a few people who might otherwise not have to bring them to the event. Now, there are some players that we'll see as we go through these five lists that were probably always going to play city-states. They're either diehard or very skilled, or they've been playing them for a long time. But I wouldn't be surprised if in particular we've gotten up to five because of the release of things like the Chariot in particular. And we will see, I think, Chariots in possibly every one of these lists. So the first player we're looking at is Jeff N, uh, who is playing Battle City Galactica, the city-states, 2,000 points. The first warband is an Hipparchos with impact of impact resistance. So this is the cavalry commander with the draw event that will give his regiment Tenacious. He has three companion cavalry and then two Scorpios. Now of the, the uh, city-states chariots, I'm not sure what mix we have, but notably in person, I have found that my opponents have been playing primarily Scorpios. Even with the points adjustment, Scorpios seems to be by far the more consistent of the two. Obviously the Flogobolon has considerably lower range, even with its effective, its effective range being 10 inches. Thanks to condensed propellant, just the longer range of the Scorpios, in addition to generally its higher ceiling and its rules that make it quite interesting and interactive to use, both exploit, exploit flanks in particular is a very powerful rule that is not difficult to pull off with a piece like a chariot. Anyway, so we have an Hipparchos with a companion cavalry and then two war chariots with the Scorpios configuration. We then have a Polymark with Arista and the Blades of Echides. That's going to give him a massive cleave score and high clash, in addition to the Arista draw event, or Aristia draw event, which changes the charge distance of any regiment within a certain range to a fixed plus five inches. This is an awesome ability. If you can afford the Arista on any of your Aristia, sorry, on any of your pieces, having a consistent plus five inch charge is you don't have to roll for it, you just roll a five. Those are long bomb charges that often you just wouldn't be able to get, and being able to make them consistently off the back of a draw event, especially when combined combined with the strategic stack mechanic of the city-states, very powerful and interesting. Now I'm going to assume, in fact, no, he will be, that Polemarch will be in that unit of five Agama with an Andromarchos. We then have four Minotaur Haspists and four Minotaur Therians. Those are interesting unit sizes because four of, obviously, when you have four units, four regiments, stands in a regiment, you have kind of the worst of all worlds in terms of your shatter math. If you lose three stands in the same turn, the regiment will break at two stands and then shatter at three. But the payoff is that in practice, four stands is about as comfortably wide as you can often go before you start to run into issues with wheeling or just clipping terrain. You can sometimes play wider if you make space for it, but four tends to be sort of a sweet spot. And with the addition of going up to six wounds, which was the most recent updates that Minotaurs received, I'm going to assume that Jeff has kind of run into the situation where he feels like he can take that risk and that the likelihood of sustaining that many casualties, like a full 18 wounds worth of dead cows in a single turn, which is what you would need to do to shatter these regiments, is tolerable, which is really interesting and cool. So four Minotaur Haspists, four Minotaur Therians, and then a unit of three Satoroi with no upgrades. Satoroi, of course, are the ambush unit in city-states, a very rare ability to always be able to come in off of the table size, no matter where the reinforcement line is. Coupled with Vanguard and Opportunist, makes them an interesting and dangerous threat 
to hit the flanks of any army. Finally, rounding out the list, we have the Warlord. Finally, an Aristarch Warlord with Atlanta's Spear in a unit of four Thorakides with an Andromachos and a Minotaur Therian Auxiliary. Now, this is a particularly interesting setup for a regiment for me, because what it's kind of notably missing that you might see on something like this is the standard of last oration. Now, this standard is admittedly very expensive, but among other things, it allows you to count as plus two stands, or the command stand of the regiment the character is attached to, counts as plus two stands for purposes of seizing objectives, which means that that light Thorakides regiment would be able to seize objectives potentially very, very early in the game, which is usually why you would see a character attached to a light unit like Thorakides. Instead, we just have the Aristarch kitted out for totally serviceable fighting. He's got seven attacks at Clash 3. That regiment can inspire, which will take him to seven attacks at Clash 4 with a little bit of cleave from Atlantis Spear, adding on to the Andromachos and the Minotaur Therian Auxiliary and just a general threat of that regiment. It's speed six with fluid formation. It has a long threat range. That unit's not durable, ultimately. You, the resolve from the Aristarch goes a very long way, but they are otherwise just defense two with a shield. But that is a early arrival unit that can potentially do quite a good job, particularly with threat extension from the Aristarch's supremacy, bullying other light regiments, but that will then need to be capitalized on by the rest of the list. Now, overall, this is kind of like an emergent style of city-states list that I haven't actually even seen locally in Canberra yet, and it is the kind of hyper-mobile list. Something that is notably absent from Jeff's list just overall is that there is not a single big anvil block. The closest thing you might consider to an anvil is the Minotaur Haspists, but there is no pike infantry. There's no hoplites, nothing like that that is using phalanx for high defense to hold an enemy in place. Instead, assets are diversified across a fairly wide, like there's plenty of activations, and there's a lot of activations in this list. Sitting at a comfortable, I think it's 11, plus of course you have the strategic stack to get you up to a pseudo 12, pseudo 13 on the turn that the Aristarch activates, the activated portion of his supremacy. And the list is mobile. The slowest thing in the entire list is speed six, right? You have two fluid formation speed six regiments. You have two speed six cows, Minotaur Haspis and the Minotaur Therians. The Minotaur Haspis have Vanguard. And then from there, it's Satoroi who also have Vanguard and fluid formation. And you have two chariots and the companion cavalry with the Hipparchos. So this is, I think, almost the extreme of something that we're going to see through a few of the city-states lists that are coming up which is an emphasis on skill expression. Without just a clean, like, we're going to have an anvil and we're going to anchor around that, this list is hard to play. In fact, I'm going to be interested to see how Jeff does, because my initial impression is it's very hard to play, especially for five rounds. Nothing in here is so durable that it really wants to take a hit. You even have a little bit of fragility baked into the Minotaur units, but everything has potential. Like, there's no regiment in this entire army that can't punch on. There is cleave on every single regiment except for the war chariots obviously every other regiment in the entire army has cleave of some sort uh potentially multiple sources of cleave and that kind of thing is going to add up particularly if you're able to use mobility to concentrate force hit and fade anything like that i am very interested to hear how jeff goes in fact there are a lot of lists that are going to be played over the course of this weekend that i kind of wanted to see how it goes and we're off to a cracking start with this complex to play and interesting highly mobile take on city states from jeff up next, we have City States again, second of five players from Matt W, and another very interesting phalanx-free list. This time, rather than cavalry, we have giants, multiple giants in point of fact. So we have an Aristarch Warlord with Arista and Expert Scouts. And in Expert Scouts, we can see where the start of this list's idea comes from, because Expert Scouts is the ability that gives all infantry regiments without phalanx Vanguard, which means that every infantry regiment in this list is going to have Vanguard, which potentially allows it to seriously motor up the board. We've got, uh, he has an Arista, that's the ability that gives, self, gives him the extra charge distance as a draw event, any unit within a certain range. Unit of three Selenoi and a unit of three Thorakides. Those are our mainstay. He'll be in the Thorakides because he has to be. Um, presumably playing those relatively cautiously, handing out Arista. I would be surprised to see that regiment in comparison to the, uh, the Aristarch we saw in the previous list where we have the, he's kitted out more for fighting and we have the Minotaur Therian. This is just MSU of Thorakides. We then have three Scorpios. So again, abandoning the Flogobolon, just taking Scorpios. I feel like that is probably the right choice at this stage, but a full three war chariots and a Promethean. 
Now, something I didn't mention in the previous list, but which I kind of wanted to mention here, is that I have noted that there is a particular synergy between any of the light regiments, like whether it's Selenoi or Thorakides. If you just have a light regiment, and especially if you give them Vanguard, that sets a reinforcement line very aggressively that those war chariots can take full advantage of on turn two. The war chariots have flank, so you have pushed the reinforcement line 18 inches forward, potentially even more because you have the Aristarchs battlefield, a uh, battle uh, infantry tactics ability, which will allow at least one of those regiments, the Thorakides or the Selenoi in this list, Thorakides in the previous one, to be 21 inches up the board at the end of the first turn. That gives you a 19 approximately inch reinforcement line, which the Flogobolans can, or Scorpios in this case, can come on from. And because they can shoot out of their flanks, they can just very cleanly drive in off of the table edge and start taking shots with a 16 inch range. And because of how tight the turning circle on a war chariot is, with effectively that very narrow frontage, they can pivot very easily, wheel very easily. You can push those 16-inch shots very deep into your opponent's lines very early in the game. It will be interesting to see if we see some of that. In our second warlord, we have, second warband, we have a polymark. And in a bit of a classic combination, we have on him Atlantis Spear and Encryption of Lighter Alloys. His warband is then... Three regiments of Agama with Andromarkos's and a Hephaestion. So he will be in, again, a very small regiment, which can potentially expose him to a bit of risk. But those three Agama are going to be fast and dangerous, and one of them will be very fast. And then we have a Hephaestion as the heavy, the only heavy in this reg in this army, which potentially it'll turn up on, typically turn up on turn three. Most of the army, you might see some medium stragglers still hanging about turning up on turn four, but most of the army will be present on turn three. Now, even more than before, this list is heavy on the activation advantage. We've got 12 activations just in terms of the cards we have access to, and then that goes up to th uh, 13 or potentially even 14 once per game once you factor in the strategic stack. It's also only running two characters. It's getting these large activation counts through the fact that you can have three Scorpios as a single inclusion in a warband, which helps it avoid what might otherwise be the trap in a list like this, which is kind of a resiliency issue. I still think that's something to be concerned of in this list. You have a lot of regiments that are very dangerous, but they are very fragile. And in particular, what's going to happen a lot is that your Agama or Thorakides will just kind of be broken, and then they'll have to rally and clash, and they're still dangerous in that circumstance. But it's sort of like one stand of Agama, but fortunately, because of those attachments, is still going to be quite dangerous. Those command stands will have eight attacks plus flurry if they come off of the strat stack. But any regiment that gets caught is in danger. And the giants don't particularly address that, I would say. The giants, I like all of the giants that are available to city-states, but even at 16 wounds and with defense 3 resolve 4 and hardened, they're, they're good. But unless you're taking a Talos, my preference generally is to treat both the Promethean and the Hephaestion as more support elements. They play very, very well around something that pins your opponent in place. And in this list, there isn't necessarily anything that you want to be using as a pinning regiment. Those Agama, for example, are too expensive to just be like thrown away as pinning regiments, which means, again, we have a very high skill expression list. I think a lot of the time playing against this list is going to feel like a pretty extreme pressure environment, particularly because of that expert scouts. Everything will be so aggressively postured, coupled with the supporting flyer from the from the Scorpios, that the the combination of withering hail and very, very aggressively positioned infantry that have solid threat range, thanks to a combination of fluid formation and high speed, is going to you're just going to need to play into this, just keep formation, play conservative. If I was running against this with Dwegom or Old Dominion or even Spires, frankly, the temptation not to spread out, just keep units mutually supporting and punish over extensions and just weather the Scorpios fire, I think is going to be critical. It is very easy to make mistakes against lists like this, and lists like this can capitalize on that. The pressure I think this exerts is very cool. If I had one criticism of this list, I would say that the three strong units of Agama and to an extent the Thorakides, basically once you hit four, but especially five stands with a movement six regiment that has fluid formation, that's when you start maximizing the threat extension benefit of fluid formation. And so the Aristarchs Regiment and the, um, the Polymarchs Regiment, those two being at four stands, will be able to make like more use of fluid formation to physically extend their threat range by angling a corner board toward the enemy. But you don't get as much of that out of the smaller, the three-stand Agama Regiments. Now, I suspect that won't hold the list back, particularly since we have the Aristia. 
and especially coupled with mobility on the Polmark is going to allow for some truly explosive mobility plays. The Polmark, frankly, using mobility just to motor across the battlefield and get to a position it wasn't in before, late in the turn, like that alone, functioning as pseudo cav is a very cool kind of play that this list can make. But when it wants to actually go loud, particularly when you're combining the strat stack with the Arista and mobility, you can get some very, very high mobility plays that can happen either early in the turn or late in the turn. And being able to make those charges as the 13th or 14th activation, like way after many opposing lists will have, like they'll have given up any ability to respond at that point because they just won't have any activations left. There are only a small number of lists in the event that will be able to do so. That's potentially very interesting and very powerful. Now, third off the bat, as City States, we have Agama and Chariots together at last, the list of Michael M. This is one of our Canberra locals, and I'm actually pleased to see that he's taken this list, because this is something he's worked on for a while. I know Michael had last minute, like, list paralysis. What should I take? I own this many Chariots. How many should I take? But I think he settled on a list that, again, skill expression is something that has really come into City States as more and more mobility options have opened up. But this time, for the first time of our City States list, we see, yes, Hoplites. So we have Hoplites in the list. We have that anvil in, in play. And we're also going to see here the Talos, which gives us a second heavy durable piece, which can act as an anchor around which you can play these mobility pieces. And this represents a departure from the previous two lists that we've seen, where we have people like Jeff and Matt who are playing just ultra mobility, just super high emphasis on mobility. If anything gets caught, it gets caught and you just deal with that. In this instance, we have elements that are attempting to pin the enemy in place to allow those other pieces to play around them. And something that I want to cover kind of at this point about the emergence of city-states as a faction and how they have changed, especially in the last six months, is the importance of Scorpios in particular, but chariots in general. And we will see here again three Scorpios. Now, city-states from the very beginning had the ability to play as a hammer and anvil style faction, where you have these big, tough regiments of men with shields and spears, and then even early on you had Therians, which are just a par excellence hammer. If Therians hit something, it stays punched. It gets very, very aggressively trod into the dirt. So you hold people in place with your regiments of hoplites, then you hit them with your Therians. This is just, this is the elemental city-states. The problem with that is that it's difficult to pin an opponent that does not want to be pinned. Anvils don't work in isolation. An anvil in a game like Conquest, there needs to be something that forces your opponent onto that anvil. Now, the scenario plays a very large part of that most of the time. Generally speaking, you're going to know at least some of the areas of the table your opponent will want to contest, and so you can position your most durable units to pin them accordingly. But that does not always work, and if you can combine that general table state and knowing where your opponent might be with the ability to exert pressure on them to close with you, that completes, for me, the power of an anvil. You have to be able to force your opponent into you. That is the second part or the second element that makes anvil units strong slash playable. And, you know, yes, Selenoi existed for a little while now, but really it is the ranged pressure, even just of a couple, like one or two Scorpios do enough damage at range that your opponent kind of knows they, they can't just sit outside of your threat range indefinitely. They can't just stay 8.1 inches away from the phalanx forever. They have to push forward or the Scorpios will just keep shooting them. And that's why in particular Scorpios for me feel transformative for city-states. Not because they're necessarily overpowered or anything like that. I think at 130 points they're aggressively good, but they don't push the curve into like, no, this unit needs further nerfs, like aggressive further nerfs. I certainly wouldn't want them to be any better. I think a Scorpios at 130 points is like as good as you can possibly make a regiment without it getting way out of hand. But I think like a Scorpion at 130 points is merely very, very, very good. What makes them so relevant to city-states is that they exert that pressure onto and to force your opponent onto anvils like the Aristarch and Hoplite combination we have in Michael's list here. So what is Michael playing? Michael is playing an Aristarch. This is a long lineage Aristarch, which allows him to have two uh, bestowed relics. And so in this case, we have the Blades of Echides and the impact inscription of impact resistance. Now, the Aristarch is going in a big unit of hoplites, and here we see what I'm going to sort of specifically call out as a little bit of anti-Old Dominion technology. One of the very popular Old Dominion things that you'll see is the Strategos, or just basically just any, any melee character can, or any character at this point, can push a unit 
up to Aura of Death 4 by taking a unit, usually of Praetorian Guards, giving them the Aura of Death 2 Profane Reliquary, and then taking the piece of equipment, Legio Ex Primogenia, the banner, gives you a further Aura of Death 2, making the Regiment Aura of Death 4. If you are 5 wide, that's 20 Aura of Death hits. If you're 4 wide, it's 16. It is a lot of Aura of Death hits coming out of a very durable Regiment. How do we deal with something like that? Well, we use pieces like this Aristarch. And so one of the Aristarch's battlefield orders allows the regiment that he's in to reroll defense rolls of six, and then he has Tenacious. And so in this unit of seven hoplites with the, Minis the Doralates and the Minotaur Haspis Auxiliary, from the front, these guys with Phalanx and Shield will be defense four, rerolling sixes, and then ignoring one failed save. Not only is this just natively very, very durable, but it means that when you are grinding into an Old Dominion unit that's dealing 20 Aura of Death hits to you every turn, you are actually going to take very, very few wounds from that because you'll be saving on fours, fives you'll just take damage from, sixes you will reroll with a two in three chance to succeed. Now 20 hits will get some hits through but this will block the overwhelming majority of aura of death attacks and is a key part in Michael's long-suffering attempt to deal with Old Dominion as an army. Rounding out the Aristarch's Warband, we have a five strong, so an outsized unit of Thelenoi, Barrage 4, Arcing Fire, Loose Formation, they're a little expensive, but ultimately 210 points is tolerable for a fair bit of firepower. And I've mentioned before, this is, I think, the only light unit in Michael's army, and having a light unit to set a reinforcement line for the chariots is a big deal. We've then got a full three Scorpios. To note, we still haven't seen a Flogobolan, not hugely surprised by that, and a Promethean. Warband 2 is a Polymark with the Primodynamic Globe and Atalanta's Spear uh, in a unit of 5 Agama with an Andromachos and then a Talos. This is the first Talos that we've seen and it's packing the Mask of Eris, which will give that Promethean unstoppable. Now, the Talos obviously is Big King Chonk himself, very tough, immune to Aura of Death, durable, fearless, etc. Very good, just for example, against Old Dominion, but I want to call out the Primodynamic Globe in particular on the Polymark as something I think is worthwhile mentioning as an adaptation. Now, the Primodynamic Globe is not particularly expensive, it's easy enough to fit into a list, and it gives a huge bubble of interference, making regiments within a certain range of it count as wizards for the purposes of interference. And this is a big deal, because especially combined with the Promethean, we have wide interference bubbles, and there are a couple of boogeyman armies in the meta right now that particularly if you play in Canberra, you want to kind of have a plan against. And fair enough, we've seen this pay off because there are going to be five Old Dominion and five Dwegom lists present at this event. And both of those factions have access to a lot of spellcasting and very dangerous spellcasting. Now, not every Old Dominion list has a Kerez, but plenty of them do. And certainly there are spellcasters, I think, in every Old Dominion list. And Dwegom is a rare case of very little in the way of list variants. There are a few flexes in the Dwegom list that we'll see, but there are an awful lot of magma sorcerers that we're about to go through. And although the Magma Sorcerer is one of the more resistant pieces to interference, because it just needs to roll those two successes, if you look at the math on how that affects the likelihood of Pyroclast going down, Pyroclast, the spell that does four hits in the flank with armor-piercing one to an enemy regiment, goes from like a 93% chance if it isn't being interfered with to a 70-something percent chance if it is being interfered with. And that is a massive difference in the likelihood of failure with that spell, and any time you can force a tempered creed dweg list to fail a spellcasting roll is a big deal. And over the course of a game, this is the damage that you avoid by not suffering those extra pyroclast hits will add up. Across 10 casts, if you don't have interference, a dweg list will expect to land nine of those hits. Across the same 10, which they'll easily do in a game, they'll only land seven if you have consistent interference most of the time. That's a big deal. So overall, having played against Michael's list a number of times, I like this. I think this list is really what we see. This is solid. This is consistent. It has plenty of opportunities for skill expression. It's not going overboard on any one thing. I think three chariots is the most that we will see in any city-states list. And that's kind of reflective, realistically, of how at least Australia tries to play. I know that there have been lists that were floating around, particularly once the chariots were spoiled, that were like, you can fit 10 chariots in a list. Firstly, 
Hot damn, that is an expensive list if you want to if you want to buy that. And also, that is not a list that I would describe as financially prudent in the face of possible future balance updates. But you do not need that many chariots in order to make them to have them have a significant impact on the rest of your army to really do significant things. Three feels like about the right upper limit. Two honestly is fine. It sort of depends what you're playing against. And this list we can see it's tested. There is nothing in here that is wasted. I hate one nine nine five points. But but I really can't say that there's anything that I would consider cutting. The closest thing to a luxury piece is those two extra stands of Selenoy, and frankly, not that expensive. Overall, very solid, and like solid, very solid, like playable, practiced list. Next up, and second to last, we have Reese King City States M6XVW. I assume that's Reese's player number running a list that has a lot of similarities to Michael's list, which we just saw. Now, I suspect this is a case of just parallel evolution, where both players have come to similar conclusions for quite similar reasons. This is the first instance we have seen of the Polymark Warlord. Uh, the Polymark Warlord was the most popular choice for a long time until the Aristarch Warlord Supremacy ability was changed. And the Aristarch, I think, is probably more complicated and subtle but the Polymark's Supremacy ability is consistent. It is just good. His unit is very good. That's his ability. And it's a really, really good ability. It makes him a better duelist. It makes his regiment outstanding. Tenacious and plus one clash go a huge way in terms of upping the performance of a regiment. And especially across a five round event over two days, having that kind of consistency, I think is the sort of thing that pays dividends. So from the top, we have Warlord Polymark with Aristia and Atlanta Spear with the Disorienting Strikes Mastery, just a little bit of extra punch in a duel. Combined with Tenacious, that's going to make this Polymark, and obviously High Clash, that's going to make this Polymark a fearsome duelist. We then have a unit of five Agama with the Andromarchos, three Minotaur Haspists, and a Talos. We then have second Warband and Aristarch with Blades of Echides, Impact of Incarceration, Impact Resistance, and Long Lineage in an eight strong, this time, Regiment of Hoplites. So a very similar technology to what we just saw in Michael's list. Next up, we have a unit of three Selenoi. As with Michael's list, that's the only light regiment in this list. More limited investment in this case, just three of them, but they will serve that outstanding purpose, both just of ranged skirmish and counter skirmish, but also setting a reinforcement line for the chariots if needed, a Promethean, and then two Scorpios. And overall, while there are a lot of similarities between this list and the list we just saw from Michael, I think you can see evidence of some very long experience in this list. In particular, the cuts that Reese has made relative to Michael's list and what he's been able to fit by making those cuts. We can see we can see fewer Selenoi, slightly different loadout on the characters, we can see one less chariot. But in exchange for those cuts, what's been fit is an entire unit of Minotaur Haspists. And Haspists are really the only thing that is missing from Michael's list that it would kind of be nice to see. And what Haspists do, well, they actually fill a number of roles because Vanguard is a very flexible ability. But what I would suspect that we see Haspists do is function as a kind of designated late arrival. Now, I know Michael uses Agama in that role. He's comfortable with them arriving late, and he uses the Aristarch's Warlord ability to make up speed difference if he needs. But in this case, when we're looking at the list, we can see the Polmark Warlord is going to likely want to make fairly significant use of the Agama. There are other pieces as well that are going to want to be active and on the board early. It's probably the Hoplites that will be autoed on in the medium category. But because the Chariots have flank, they're not contributing reinforcement dice. And so you are rolling for all of the other mediums. And the Haspists are a piece that, look, if you need to, they can just arrive on turn three after everything else. You can even auto on another medium if you need or auto them on if you need because the Talos also has flank. And because they can push 18 inches up the table edge or offer reinforcement line, which you can have set with a combination of chariots and Selenoi, they contribute to the battle very aggressively the turn they arrive, even if they arrive late. Michael's list, by comparison, is playing a slightly longer game, it's got slightly more ranged, and so it's putting that role to the Agama, which has a more sort of significant impact on the game plan. Proactivity versus reactivity, that kind of thing. Now, that's basically the limit to how much I'm willing to opine about Reese's list, because Reese has been playing city-states basically for longer than they have existed. But overall, like Michael's, I would say this is a list that shows a great deal of practice, a great deal of consideration, and kind of, again, that evolving city-state's identity of great depth of capacity for skill expression. 
Now, last up, and our definite contender for wildcard among the city-states, we have Michael S. running a high-stakes battle, and this is, look, it's not a meme list exactly, but it is doing some interesting things. Firstly, you have an Aristarch Warlord just running Atlanta's Spear in, I'm going to assume, he could be in the Thoracides, uh, or he could be in that unit of six Phalangides with the Dorolites. That's something he'll comfortably be able to choose. I believe it's the beginning of the first reinforcement phase. It could fit well in either of those regiments. We have the Phalangides, six strong. You can just run those in pencil formation. There's no real reason not to. And they're surprisingly dangerous, and that low frontage has a lot of useful externalities. Ultimately, Phalangides tend to fall behind hoplites because they are still trying to be that kind of like, eh, it can fight and it can defend, but it can't defend as well as hoplites and it can't fight as well as things like Agama. Phalangides are still sort of finding their role, but there are a few, particularly with pike formation, there are a few situations and a few lists that they will run into over the course of this event where that might be very useful, and they are kind of more of a multi-role regiment. I have a personal deep soft spot for them, because Flurry is a very good rule, but they are obviously a little less taken internationally, probably for good reason. We then got four Thorakides with a Minotaur Therian Auxiliary. Especially if the Aristarch is added to this regiment, it's big and it's dangerous. I'm actually interested where the Aristarch will go, because both of those do seem like viable choices, particularly because the Doralates giving him Flurry is a pretty big deal since he doesn't have it natively. But on the other hand, the Thorakides regiment gets much tougher if it goes to Resolve 4. Of course, so does the Phalanchides, though they are natively Resolve 3. So definitely both viable choices. We then have just a single Scorpios. Now, what this says to me is Scorpios are very expensive, and I only wanted one. That could, that might not be the case, because there is a definite theme through the rest of this list. But if I see just one Scorpios, I'm going to assume it's usually just one Scorpios, because Scorpios are very expensive, particularly once you factor in the Australian exchange rate. Two would kind of be nice, but this is also a list where the Scorpios is maybe very, very slightly less useful, because one of the great advantages of chariots is that they are size two, they can see over size one infantry, and we are rapidly reaching the end of size one infantry because there are a lot of cows in our future. We've got three Minotaur Therians, then a Polymark with Aristia uh, and the Blades of Egides and Disorienting Strikes. So see, he is juiced coming out at 160 points in a big unit of eight Hoplites with the Minotaur Haspist Auxiliary, and then three more Minotaur Haspists, and then three more Minotaur Haspists, and then a Hephaestian to close things out. Now, ultimately, this is only, I want to say, three units of cows. It's not actually that obscene. Um, Minotaur Haspis are very solid. Minotaur Therians are very solid, particularly if you can pin your opponent in place with other regiments. You have the one chariot. There's plenty of quality present here, but this is a much harder list for me to read. I'm not sure how everything will work together. I know Haspists work well in isolation, but typically they work in isolation. I'm not sure where the Hephaestian will go. It's very, very dangerous, but will it play around certain other things? There's only one real kind of pinning element, the one like one anvil, which is the hoplites, although the hoplites are very durable at eight stands with a polymark involved in them. But it's a bit trickier to read how everything else will move and deploy. The Minotaur Haspists have vanguard moves, so they'll get aggressively up the field, but once they're up the field, they don't have fluid formation in the same way as the Agama, although they will fight and they will endure in particular, the wound count is significantly higher than Agama regiments. So they can function, typically speaking, Minotaur Haspists will take a punch, and so maybe the plan is to use the Haspists as temporary anvils for other pieces to engage. It will be very interesting to see. Okay, that concludes our city-state section. We are now into Dwegom, proceeding through the factions in alphabetical order. And Dwegom, God help me, are another faction with... Good lord, I've been recording for a while already. Dwegom are another faction with a full five players. Now, I hope you like Tempered Sorcerers, because we're going to see a lot of them. But there is some flex inside these Dwegom lists, doing some interesting things. And we're going to start with one of the most interesting ones, which is Three Dragons by Will from Canberra. These dragons, I happen to know, are effectively affectionately referred to as Chungus, Bungus, and I forget the third, but possibly Humongous. This is a triple Drake list, and it is interesting and scary. Now, we have a Tempered Sorcerer, and I'm pretty sure this is the first and only Fire School Sorcerer that we are going to see. And the reason why, and I think this is the right call in this case, is that there's just the one Tempered Sorcerer. Magma Sorcerers tend to work well when there are two of them, and one of them is the Warlord. 
because you have that synergy of making terrain erupting with the Warlord and then doing a Pyroclast and then having the other Magma Sorcerer do a Pyroclast. In this case, there's just the one Tempered Sorcerer because when you're trying to fit this many Drakes into a list, you have some limitations you need to operate under. Uh, and so we just have a Fire School Tempered Sorcerer. That's fine. The Fire School Tempered Sorcerer is very scary and very dangerous. If your list has interference, you'll be very grateful for it against this kind of a guy. He has Graft of Fire and is riding a Hellbringer Drake, and he's joined in his Warband by Hold Ballista and Fireforged. No upgrades on anything. We then have a Tempered Steel Shaper in Fireforged. This is an interesting regiment choice. Now, I suspect it's probably just down to model ownership and what Will has access to. I don't know if Will has access to two Tempered Sorcerers. The Tempered Steel Shaper is, is very, very good, but I don't 100% know if this list needs it exactly, because in particular, what he's very good for is he's good at buffing the regiment he's in, he's good at debuffing armor. That's usually going to be his most powerful ability if he's not adding hardened. Adding hardened is also nice. He's a good source of tokens, like you don't have to roll anything, etc. He is, however, expensive. But if we are taking him, I don't mind him in Fireforged. There are models coming with the Tempered Steel Shaper that I think you'll just be grotesque in. Magma Forged in particular with the Steel Shaper terrify me, but those don't exist and so aren't legal yet. So the Fireforged are a nice middle ground. They can shoot, he can shoot along with them. And the melee stats on the Fireforged, although they are mediocre, when you add the Steel Shaper into that combat ability, you start getting sort of surprising output, especially given how durable they are, which makes this not a regiment that you necessarily want to be in melee, but if it's in melee, the Steel Shaper means it can kind of fight for a little while, and his ability to debuff the armor, along with armor piercing too, lots of armor piercing shooting in this list, is, is terrifying if you are susceptible to that. We then have a Hold Rag juiced out with Dregbrut, uh, and fueled by the furnace. So this boy has relentless blows and a whopping cleave three. He's very dangerous, can do a ton of hits with very, very high cleave. And he will be in a unit of six initiates, an outstanding brick, just tough, very durable, iron discipline. Add him in there for even more resolve. They're just tough as guts. They will do a few pokey attacks and he will sit there swinging Dregbrew to his heart's content, making this a very nice combined hammer and anvil regiment for the rest of the list to play around. We then have three initiates, they're just very durable for their cost, they can hold, they can pin, etc. They can just hold an objective if they need to, they're not too expensive. And then, as promised, we have an ironclad drake and another ironclad drake. These things terrify me. I'm an old Dominion player. I'm immune to the terror, and these things still terrify me. The Cleave 2 Terrifying 2, even if you are immune to the Terrifying 2, and Relentless Blows, and High Clash, and Tilt Attacks, and Fast, and Unstoppable, these things are possibly just the best all-round melee bruiser in the entire game for their points cost. To the point of like maybe being about 5% too much. These things could afford to be like 10 points more expensive and it would still be fine because they are just a perfect combination of everything that you want. They are fast enough at speed seven with good impact attacks and unstoppable to be very high threat. They're hard to pin down and their melee is prodigious. Cleave two, terrifying two is good against like everything and against stuff in particular that is just good defense and okay resolve is terrifying because those two abilities multiply over top of one another and allow you to just do huge amounts of damage, particularly if there's even a few ones in there, and with 12 dice there almost always will be, produces an absolute ton of hits. This thing averages, or at least this thing should average, about 10 hits per clash, but the upper limit for what it can roll, like I have seen plenty of times, Ironclad Drake just be like, oh, that was 16 hits, your regiment is dead. And so, despite the fact that three dragons is like, ha ha ha, oh, it's a funny meme. Three dragons. Dragons are so good, Will knows exactly what he is doing. With two Fireforged and the Tempered Sorcerer's ranged attacks, Tempered Sorcerer's spells, and the Hold Ballista, and then good pinning regiments, and two Ironclad Drakes, this list is just well-rounded. It's got outstanding heavy beaters, it's got outstanding anvils, it's got tons of ability to hold objectives, and it's got good, good firepower. It's playing into a bit, yes, it has three dragons, which look awesome. Have you seen those models? They're fantastic. But playing into a bit nevertheless nets will a list that just performs. It performs across all spectrums of the game. Yes, you might not have the entire army on the board until turn four because the second drake might not arrive. It doesn't matter. The drakes are excellent. Everything in this list is very, very good. This is a scary list. I think the, the, in particular, the flaw of performance for this list is going to be the ironclad drakes murdered a whole bunch of stuff and the initiates were very hard to kill and everything shot a whole bunch of stuff. Like this list will perform well, even in situations where things go badly for it. And that's a big deal. Next up we have, I'm going to presume that's pronounced 
Magbanus, uh, but we'll see, uh, by Alberto. And this is the start of where we're going to say Tempered Sorcerer Magma and another Tempered Sorcerer Magma uh, uh, quite a lot for the remainder of this section. There is at least one list coming that's spicy, um, but look, these, these choices are very good and they are very good for a reason. They're strong, they're consistent, they generate a ton of tokens, because even if there's not an enemy in sight, the Tempered Sorcerer Magmas can start generating tokens very early just by flowing throwing the spells out into the ether. In this case, we have a Magma School Tempered Sorcerer, Warlord on a Hellbringer, and a unit of Hold Warriors just to enable the Hellbringer to be taken. We then have a Tempered Sorcerer Magma in a unit of Fireforge, so, you know, not on a not on a Drake, this is not a double Drake, a double Hellbringer Drake list, but Fireforge still shoot very, very well. We then have an Ardent Karawag with Flaming Oratory. Now, I don't know for sure, but I am going to assume that the Ardent is going to be placed in the Flame Berserkers. And that's mostly for, I believe, Rancor is the spell that allows the command stand to count as two extra stands for purposes of scoring, which means that you have a light, fast regiment that can score, which is just useful, right? It's just very good to have that ability to score early. It's not it's not obligatory, you don't have to have it in every single list, but it's very good to have. We then have three Wardens with Thunderbearer and three Initiates. Wardens, dangerous, choppy, fast, just a good well-rounded unit. Not uh, super durable, but they are still Dwegom, Defense 3, Resolve 4, Wounds 5. They tend to go the distance, but they tend to go the distance beaten up and bloodied. Still quite scary, and a unit of three Initiates. I would really like that Flame Berserker Regiment just to be a little bit bigger, because it's expensive already with an Ardent Karawag in it, that's a 300 point regiment which yes can score but only has 15 wounds and if you could just find some points somewhere getting one more stand even would make that regiment harder to break etc it would just I'm, in my experience playing against that kind of thing if you can outsize that regiment just a little it tends to pay dividends nevertheless very solid and a spellcaster generating token so we have three so far in this list Finally, we have a Hold Rag with Arena Champion, which gives him Flurry. Cleave one still just as a baseline. Good, dangerous. A unit of Hold Thanes with a Santa Vera and Herald of Magma. Herald of Magma, in addition to just giving the Hold Thanes themselves, not the Hold Rag Aura of Death, turns uh, terrain that they're in into Erupting, which will key off of the Magma Sorcerer spells. So you can use that to basically as a pseudo arc node for the X War Machine players in the audience. You can use it to extend the range of those Magma Sorcerer spells, which of course a 6x4 table is a big deal. And then an Ironclad Drake. Everything I just said about Ironclad Drake still applies. They're very, very good and very dangerous, making this a double Drake list. So in comparison to Will's list, which we just saw, this list is doing a lot of the same stuff, but it's leaning straight into the Double Sorcerer Magma, just good, solid, consistent performance with tons of tokens. Two Tempered Sorcerers, both of them Magma and an Ardent Karawag, is going to generate a lot of tokens fairly quickly, which gives you that, as long as the Sorcerers are within range to spend those tokens, because the Ardent Karawag can't, gives you this initial burst of resiliency that will often produce situations where your opponent comes into you and they'll throw a punch at one of your units and it will just whiff. It will just whiff because you'll just spend five tokens and ignore five of those hits. And when they were expecting to maybe kill something, nothing happens. And when you have regiments like Wardens in particular or Flame Berserkers that are benefiting from that, you can go the distance against that first hit and really like respond with spells and the Hellbringer Drake and just counter assault. And so in my experience playing against lists like that, it's about measured pressure. If you have hypothetically pieces like Scorpios, for example, and you can put pressure on them that incentivizes them to spend those tokens early, and you can wear down just by range attacks. Yes, they will endure a lot of your range attacks, but if you can just poke and prod at them to wear down those tokens, or else force them to take damage, then you can throw that initial punch with at least a little bit more confidence once the lines are joined. If you don't have the ability to do that, this kind of list can spell trouble, and it's why the Tempered Creed is still to this day, despite multiple rounds of adjustments, considered the most powerful creed. Next up we have Alex Self with green dwegs and spam and once again it is a double sorcerer, this time double sorcerer I believe on Drake. So we have two Hellbringer Drakes, and I think it's going to be a double Ardent list as well for true maximum token generation. So, first warband, Tempered Sorcerer on a Hellbringer Sorcerer, and three Fireforged. Second warband, Tempered Sorcerer on a Hellbringer Sorcerer, and three on a Hellbringer Drake, and three Fireforged. Third warband, Ardent Karawag with Invocation of the Shattering and Flaming Oratory in a unit of five Flame Berserkers, and three Initiates. And fourth warband, 
Ardent Kerouac with Focused in a unit of five Flame Berserkers. So everything that I just said about the Ardent Kerouacs in Berserkers just benefiting from a few more wounds, this is what I mean, right? If you can get those models out, those regiments out to five, even just four stands plus the Ardent, but especially five stands plus the Ardent, their ability to go the distance, particularly as you put uh, tokens into them. The end of this list has a lot of tokens with four spellcasters casting five spells per turn, regardless of where the enemy is. You have this deep pool of resilience that then the the regiment it takes that initial punch you ablate sort of like the worst of it maybe you take a little bit of damage on a push through the tokens but you still have plenty of pieces to deal damage with because now one of the things that we will note is there is no flaming oratory on either of those ardents instead we have invocation of the shadow ring oh no sorry there is flaming oratory no sorry there's no not flaming oratory the one that gives aura of death plus one um i can't remember what it's called but instead we have flaming oratory which is tenacious and invocation of the shadow ring and what that says is that yes these flame berserkers have some aura of death but they are there because they are a regiment with six attacks with class three that is a lot of attacks at a good clash. Flame Berserkers punch on very, very well, particularly against regiments that just, you know, defense three, that kind of thing. And the invocation of the Shattering, giving flawless strikes to that many attacks, this is a regiment that really benefits from going into its first clash, even if it gets punched, with plenty of meat left. Now, that said, this is still a list that is running four characters with some expensive upgrades, which means that if you can get into the center of the Tootsie Pop, and particularly if you can put damage on those Hellbringer Drakes, they can break and crumble. If you can engage the Fire Forged, if you can hold off the Flame Berserkers, if you can counter battery fire, particularly if you can concentrate fire on a Hellbringer Drake, they can be brought down. They've only got only 14 wounds. That is less than a Regiment of Fire Forged has, for example, at Defense 3. Like they are less durable than a Regiment of Fire Forged. They don't attrit, they don't they don't sustain damage that reduces their performance. But they are easier to kill than a regiment of Fireforge. And if so, if you have, for example, three Scorpios and you can focus fire on a Hellbringer, it is a chink in the armor of this kind of list that especially tends to force your opponent to commit tokens to try to save them. That said, the list overall is, is very fearsome. The combination of Aura of Death and Flawless Strikes on big Flame Berserker units and Tenacious and etc. and all of the spell casting. There is a reason why this list is called Green Dregs, Green, Green Dwegs and Spam. It's got not a ton of different things going on. Alex is relatively new to Dwegom and they're playing a list that caters well to just learning the faction. But there's just an absolute ton of strength here. Dweg are one of the strongest factions in the game and lists like this are why. Third to last, bless his heart, Cam from Canberra running the only non-tempered creed list with an ardent Kerouac. Now, the ardent Kerouac warlord means that you don't have access to the tempered creed, and instead you have access to the ardent creed, which is actually really, really good. It's just not the Tempered Creed. It gives all of your command stands plus two attacks and lets your regiments perform a free rally at the end of any action the first time they are broken, which is awesome. Like, that's a really big deal. It keeps your command stands trucking. It's just, that's really good. And it's astounding that it's not the best army ability, but it's generally considered, probably reasonably, not the best army ability. Uh, he also has Righteous Annihilation as his own supremacy ability, which gives, uh, it doesn't even matter. It's something. Rerolls, extra charge distance on objectives. You are taking him for the Creed. His supremacy is okay. Okay. Now, here we see for the first time Memory of Breath, which is the ability to give extra aura of death to the regiment, and Flaming Oratory, and he will be going in that regiment of five Flame Berserkers, which will make them aura of death three and tenacious. That's nice. Those are good things. We then have three Wardens and three more Wardens and Hold Ballistae. This is four Hold Ballistae, so it's relatively outsized, relying on its shield and wound count not to get broken and shattered in a single turn. Very possible. Now, just I want to mention those Wardens, because Wardens in Tempered Creed, you can use Tempered Tokens to keep them alive and keep them punching. They have really high attack counts. It's That's solid. Wardens in Ardent Creed are kind of a different beast entirely, and specifically Wardens in Ardent Creed are a regiment that says... I can take 14 wounds and then turn around and on the clap back, make nine attacks hitting on fours with cleave one. And that's like, okay, yes, it's less damage than an ironclad drake, for example, but from a, a wounded command stand, putting out nine attacks hitting on fours with cleave is really, really solid. And it lets this list go through bad engagements and fight in a way that it's not the same as the Tempered Creed, right? The Tempered Creed spends that limited fruitful but limited supply of tokens 
to absorb the first hit, the Ardent Creed takes those casualties and just punches you back very, very hard anyway. Ultimately, the Tempered Creed is probably the stronger of the two, but if you play into this kind of a list, and you do 14 wounds to those Wardens, and you break them, then they auto-rally, and then they inspire, and then they clash, and you just suffer a whole bunch of wounds on the clapback, you have to be aware of that as a risk. Things like those Agama units in the City States, for example, could punch into something like this, do a ton of wounds, and then just have like the one surviving command stand nearly wipe the Agama out. We then have in Warband 3, which is the second warband, I'm not going to ask questions there, a hold reg with Fueled by the Furnace in a unit of four hold thanes with a standard bearer. We then have three hold warriors and then three dragon, dragon slayers and three dragon slayers. Um, dragon slayers are a regiment I feel probably has fallen pretty significantly behind how well-rounded as a bruiser the ironclad drake is, but I can war games on a budget like many of us and I don't think he owns any ironclad drakes. And to be frank, I've seen his Dragon Slayers. They are beautiful painted, and if I was him, I would use them as well. It does, however, impose some limitations on the list, because Dragon Slayers, unlike the Ironclad Drake, when they arrive, they will be slower onto the battlefield. The Ironclad Drake's speed allows it to motor to catch up with things, even if it isn't on the field that early, whereas the Dragon Slayers at speed 5 not necessarily able to do so. Now, this is an Ardent Creed list, which means that those Dragon Slayer command stands will have 8 attacks each, and the regiment will auto-rally if it breaks. And that is some reason to take the Dragon Slayers, but for my money, I would like to have seen maybe one unit of Dragon Slayers and one Ironclad Drake. And that's because the Ironclad Drake also has its own synergy with the Tempered, the Ardent Creed, because it gives rerolled, it gives flurry to command stands within a certain range, which when your command stands have extra attacks, is really, really good. Nevertheless, these guys are going to be very scary and very dangerous once they connect. The question, like the challenge, obviously, will be getting them into combat with just their March 5 and Standard Bearer, getting them into combat and then making those ultra-high damaging command stand attacks in particular. This regiment is putting out 18 attacks on the Clash if it arrives fully intact, and that certainly does outperform a Drake if it can just get there. Overall, I know Cam is Cam like just likes, he just likes the Ardent Creed and credit to him, and he's been slowly learning how to play this over time in the chances that he gets to play. I think he had a baby arrive recently and credit, you know, just fair enough for just, just pushing through and playing this kind of list that he likes, and I wish him all of the best with it. Last up, we have a throwback with a double fire sorcerer list. So not double magma, this is double fire. I actually may have misread that the first time around, which is very interesting to see and also obviously still very powerful. The thing about the fire magma, in particular the tempered sorcerer warlord, is that the fire school has two offensive spells and so you cast them and they're very dangerous. It's very good. It's less consistent than the Magma Sorcerer. And in particular, it can have a little bit of an issue with being starved of tokens early because Fire Sorcerers can't cast spells except on enemies. All of their spells are offensive, which means that if you kite the, Sem the Tempered Sorcerers at the beginning of the game, you have the opportunity to go into the mid game with them having a relatively low token count. And that can actually be a very big deal. Although of course, once they start shooting, the fire spells do an awful lot of damage. So this is a Graft of Fire, Fire School, Hellbringer, Sorcerer Rider with three Fire Forge with a standard bearer as the rest of the Warband. We then have a Hold Reg with Dregbrood in six Initiates, similar to what Will was running. It's a very, very solid option. And three Dragon Slayers. We then have an Ardent Kerouag with Flaming Oratory for Tenacious in three Flame Berserkers, a Tempered Sorcerer for the Fire School with Focused. Now, Focused you can't take if you take Hellbringer Sorcerer. Focused is a very powerful mastery because it allows you reroll on a spell. So this Tempered Sorcerer will be able to do a ton of damage. He's in a unit of three Fireforged. Probably he might be in the Ballista, but I would expect him to be in the Fireforged just because they're much more durable. And then some Ballista. Now, notwithstanding the presence of that very big Initiate block, this is probably the most fragile of the Dragom lists that we've seen. It's got that one big initiate block, which is very durable, but then we see sort of like Fireforge, which are going to be a bit slower onto the battlefield. You'll usually want the Hellbringer Drakes on first. You're going to need to think about, so as, as Isaac is playing this, he's going to need to think about keeping that that Hellbringer Drake in particular alive and keeping the Ardent Kerouag alive because it's only, you're not going to have as many tokens and it's just got the three, uh, even with Flaming Oratory, it just has the three Flame Berserkers to shelter in. If they can manage this, if Isaac can manage that, there is a lot going on in this list. It's kind of having all of its cakes and eating them too, with two sorcerers and the hold reg and the ardent. It just has to manage 
all of the competing demands for protection that the various different pieces have. You need to keep the Fireforge from being engaged, although of course the Fire Sorcerer of Fireforge, if he gets engaged, will just explode the people he's engaged with. You need to keep the Fireforge from being engaged. You need to make sure that the Ardent Kerouag's unit doesn't get ganged up on in a way that it can't survive. You need to keep the Hellbringer Sorcerer from being subjected to counter battery fire, and you need to make sure the Initiates are fighting. But if the list does all of that, it really is a kind of list that does everything, and it is good to see the return of the fire school in some lists, because the fire spells are really, really scary and really dangerous. Next up, 100 Kingdoms. We have 300 Kingdoms players, a very serviceable representation in a field of 23, and this list belongs to Saxon King. Can we just pause for a moment and appreciate what an absolutely killer name that is, not just in general, but for a 100 Kingdoms player in particular? That's, that's awesome. Now, out the gate, one of the things I'm not sure about is which army-wide special rule Saxon has chosen to go with here. My assumption is that they have gone with Relentless Drill, given there's that huge block of Gilded Legion that we can see there. But it's showing support 2 on the Gilded Legion, and I think the army builder would calculate them up to support 3 if they had taken Relentless Drill. So they may have taken the Veteran's Ability instead but I feel like it would calculate that as well. So I'm not really sure. Could go either way. For this list, I would definitely be choosing Relentless Drill, particularly with regiments like that. Now, we have in Warband 1 an Imperial Officer, not Warlord. He has Armor of Dominion, which strips cleave from regiments from stands in base contact with him and disorienting strikes. And his battlefield drills are Brace for Impact and On Your Feet, giving double time and... Bastion 1 to the regiment that he's in. Now, he is almost certainly going in that Gilded Legion block, who also had double time, uh, which is a bit of a wasted, a bit of a waste in terms of doubling up on the draw event, but the Drillmaster gives extra attacks to the Gilded Legion, and if they're playing wide, that's totally fine. So, we have two units of Mercenary Crossmen. They're cheap, they're cheerful for their very, very low points cost. They're one of the best range units in the game for their very, very low points cost. And then we have a huge block of eight Gilded Legion. Now, this can play, it can play five wide, it can play three wide, depending on how much you want to take advantage of either support or the five attacks. If this is a Relentless Drill list, my assumption is that you will play that flexibly, being relatively willing to play them a little bit more narrow. If this is a veterans list, then you'll almost certainly play them wider to take maximum advantage of those attacks. We then have a chapter mage warlord with kiss farewell, school of water, and focused in a unit of three men at arms. Now she is more expensive than the unit she is joining, but she joining, but she does a lot. Firstly, she just by herself is a very very powerful ranged attacker with barrage seven, volley three, deadly shot, eighteen inch range, meaning that that little unit of men at arms can just caddy her around and it can just make range attacks. And she's the only one that will shoot, but she will shoot. And I have had games where pieces like that have done just tons of damage. It's just chip damage, but it's very, very good chip damage. She is arguably more damaging than a chariot, and we would pay 130 points for a chariot. Now, the main thing that she's going to be do is doing is throwing out focused school of water healing spells. I think most of the rest of the list after her is chariot, sorry, is cavalry, which means that she will basically be stuck to that gilded legion block like glue. It's the only regiment that she's meaningfully going to heal because school of water doesn't heal cavalry, it just heals infantry, but she will be able to heal usually something like six wounds to that gilded legion regiment every turn, which means that it is it's a death star, like there is a lot of investment going into that unit, but it will do a very great deal of damage and it will absorb a lot as well. The risk obviously is that if she gets scalpeled out and killed, uh, she may have to divert some of her healing to keeping her own regiment alive. And look, frankly, if something like three Scorpios or even just some very, very dedicated wizards or Dwegom guns zero in on those men-at-arms, they could just die. So Saxon will have to be careful making sure that she stays alive. But if she does, look, she's just going to do a great... She's going to mint value. She's going to mint value at range, and she's going to mint value with healing, keeping those Gilded Legion alive for as long as possible. We then have a Priory Commander Crimson Tower Warlord with the wonderful eccentric fighting style. The eccentric fighting style, in addition to giving him two extra attacks, allows him to reroll all of his attacks. That includes range, that includes, well, includes range if he had them. You can put that on a, a, a chapter mage if you're so inclined. But in particular, it lets him reroll both his clash attacks and his impact attacks and his duels. Now, it forces him also to reroll saves if he's dueled, but the payoff is more than worth it. It turns him into an absolute impact hit monster. We then have two units of three Crimson Tower with Sandabarrows and a unit of five Ashendorn with a Sandabarrow. Now, 
I am not 100% sure where that chapter master will go. My assumption under normal circumstances would be the Ashen Dawn because giving them terror can go a long way in terms of increasing their damage output, particularly against other regiments. But I'm not sure five Ashen Dawn needs any help, to be perfectly honest. Like that's, they're, they're fine. They're fine here, how are you? So he could easily go in one of those Crimson Tower regiments with a real emphasis on charging and clashing, or maybe he will go in the Ashen Dawn to give them terror and even more attacks. Now, this list is a Death Star and a half list. Its activation count is not particularly high, particularly compared to some goblin archetypes. You can get really wide lists with 100 kingdoms. This list is built around two absolute Death Stars with plenty of support. It's got a lot of heavies. It's going to be arriving late on the battlefield and it only has a single medium scoring regiment, which means it is really reliant on the Ashen Dawn and the Gilded Legion to carry the day. My guess is you're going to roll three reserve dice. Actually, I think Forward Force exists on the Imperial Officers now. Yeah, it does. How about that? I remember to rule. So the Gilded Legion will have flank. You will almost certainly auto on the Ashen Dawn, and then the Crimson Tower will just arrive when the Crimson Tower arrive. If it's later in the game, that's fine. The Chapter Mage will have to hang back until the Gilded Legion arrive. A lot rests on those two regiments. Now, like those two regiments with the support that's being offered for them, yeah, they can kind of carry the game a lot of the time. But if your opponent knows how to fight and handle that kind of thing, there are pieces that can tank that kind of stuff. Like if you have to run one of those two regiments into a Talos, it's going to take a really, really long time to put him down. So it's going to be interesting to see how this list performs. My impression is that the double Death Star there's maybe not enough support for it. The list has to hang back and be very fragile during the early game. Yeah, the ranged is nice. Like, this is good ranged. But I'm just worried that when the hammer blow falls from those big heavy regiments, this list won't have forced enough of their opponent's chaff to commit, and it will be susceptible to being bogged down. It'll be susceptible to just having little units ablate those Death Stars while you accrue advantage, pin pieces down. The Crimson Tower, in that respect, may end up being quite important, and so if they don't arrive in time, that can be a problem. It's very possible that one of those regiments doesn't arrive until the fifth turn. So look, we will see. There's a hell of a lot of punch, there's a hell of a lot of chonk, but it's very concentrated. Next up, we have Dan S with All About That Mage. And this is an Imperial Officer. This is probably going to be an infantry-based list. We have an Imperial Officer Warlord, and this is 100 Kingdoms Relentless Drill. The fact that this army is showing that and the other one isn't makes me think that maybe Saxon forgot to select his and should probably tell the tournament organizer about that. Anyway, um, we have Imperial Officer with Brace for Impact on your feet, Forward Force Rapid Deployment. This gives multiple infantry units each turn Vanguard Deployment. We then have a unit of five men-at-arms with Bastion, so Standard Bearer Season Veteran. I'm going to assume that this regiment will be fighting independently and not be joined by anyone, and that the Gilded Legion will have the Imperial Officer in it, but it could go the other way around. You could put the Imperial Officer in the men-at-arms just for a little bit of extra resolve, in which case you probably shouldn't have taken the Season veteran because he already gives them Bastion. But on the other hand, the Gilded Legion have also been given Bastion. So Dan, Dan, I don't know what you've done here, but you've overpaid for something. You've definitely overpaid for a seasoned veteran on one of these two regiments, unless there's Steel Legion I haven't seen yet. Let's hope. We have three militia with a Servite, and we have six Gilded Legion. So that's like, that is a solid size regiment. It is like Gilded Legion, Stand of regiment of six. That's tough. That's solidly tough. It's not a world beater Death Star. But it will kind of go the distance, particularly since the list name foreshadows a mage. You just need to keep them safe from really like aggressive plays. And this list should probably be wide enough to accommodate that. Ah, there we go. Then we have six Steel Legion. So we might see the Imperial Officer here, because although these guys have a Drill Master, which gives the double time, which the Imperial Officer has already taken, the Drill Master gives extra attacks as well in this case, and so can be worth the investment. Giving these guys Bastion gives you a lot of Bastion. Now, Bastion kind of has diminishing returns, because you have to activate all of the pieces, right? You have to, you have to get them active to activate Bastion to get the draw event online. And the more regiments you have with Bastion, the harder it is to do that before they start getting punched. But it's still six Steel Legion. They're scary and dangerous, and giving them Bastion is not bad. We then have a Priory Commander, Crimson Tower, just as he is with a cheap unit of Order of the Crimson Tower, not paying for Standard Bearer, and then four Ashen Dawn. This case, I definitely suspect the Priory Commander will go in the Ashen Dawn to give them Terror, a little bit more impact. It's a very solid synergy. And we then have a Chapter Mage with Lady's Favor. I don't know. That gives her Tenacious in duels. I'm going to assume he had five points spare. 
Good use of five points, Dan. Uh, School of Water with Focus, so again, healing usually six wounds a turn, and there are multiple regiments that she can benefit from in this case. Unit of five mercenary crossbowmen. That's a little wide, but okay, five mercenary crossbowmen, and that's the end of the list. So that is a six-strong mercenary crossbowmen regiment. Um, that's They're not all going to be able to shoot. You cannot run a regiment that wide most of the time. It's going to be durable. Uh, it is going to be durable. I would definitely have considered maybe splitting her out into a little unit of men-at-arms, finding some extra points somewhere. Five mercenary crossbowmen with a chapter mage in them. Firstly, has a target on its head. Secondly, is going to get engaged very quickly. And thirdly, I don't know if she can heal through. Like, they're not tough. They are their defense one, resolve two, maybe up to resolve three. They have to be kept safe. Now, the good news is that the heavies in this list go super hard. Uh, generally speaking, I'm going to expect the Gilded Legion to only arrive some of the time. If the Steel Legion have the Imperial Officer in them, I'm not sure where the Imperial Officer will be going because every regiment that he could join duplicates his abilities, which is a little bit of a scornergy there. But with the Ashen Dawn usually arriving on turn three and one of those solid infantry blocks arriving on turn three, and the Chapter Mage, look, nominally being in a regiment that's durable enough to last through a little bit of attention, I think the only thing that would be needed to make this list kind of genuinely perfect, look, I would just swap the men-at-arms into, like, swap the men-at-arms and the mercenary crossbowmen between those two groups so that the wizard can go in the men-at-arms because they are actually durable and and she can actually heal them if she needs to. Anyway, it is what it is. This is, this is a list, I would love this list to have, like, one more disposable regiment. And there is absolutely enough extra width in these in these different regiments to accommodate that. Like just a unit of men at arms, just a little unit of men at arms. But as is, we can see a nice diversification of force. I like the Gilded Legion, I like the men at arms with support, I like the Steel Legion en masse, I like the, the Ashen Dawn, like there's plenty going on here. All of these units individually are very capable of winning fights. Where the list has I would say a little bit of potential to run into issues is that kind of unlike maybe the city states list that we've been seeing it is it is straightforward it's not doing anything that's like oh the play it is just pushing these big solid units forward and letting them be big solid units and this is kind of hundred kingdoms in a nutshell right one of the advantages of hundred kingdoms is that they're very well rounded one of the disadvantages of hundred kingdoms is that when you, when you are very well rounded by definition you kind of like an edge now, I am going to suspect that in any given game that Dan plays, one of the heavy regiments, maybe even two of them, are going to outperform. The Ashen Dawn will do very well, or the Ashen Dawn will create space for the Steel Legion or the Gilded Legion to do very well. The list may struggle to capitalize on that just because it could really use like a couple of disposable scoring units. The Men at Arms are very like everything in this list that scores is 200 points minimum. And it would be really nice to have like a 105 point regiment, maybe two of them that can just sit on an objective and chill. Those militia, for example, they could be, they could be, and as it is, they're going to have to maybe work with and defend the mercenary crossbowmen. But if they were men at arms, you had a couple more men at arms, you just spread out a little bit more. I think this list would play a bit more into the detachment style that 100 Kingdoms lists work very well with. This list is good though. It's good and it's cool. And I know it will work for Dan because it's what he's been working on. It's what he's been practicing with. He's not going way overboard with this. He's got some relatively straightforward aspirations. And I think the list serves them well. Our third and final Hundred Kingdoms list is Salty with Ninua's Tears. So we have another Water Mage, but that's fine. I love the Water Mage. Credit to her. Uh, this is from Dennis, another Canberran. And I know that Dennis didn't 100% read the Imperial Officer rules in this particular case, and he's jumping into 100 Kingdoms. He also owns Wadrun, jumping into 100 Kingdoms with enthusiasm, and has missed a rule in his army, which is that the Imperial Officer is allowed to have two battlefield drills, which means he's effectively paying, playing 20 points down. The TO might be very nice and allow him to make a small adjustment, because genuinely he's wasted some points in this list. But 20 points, not the end of the world. What is that? 1% of your list. So we have a Chapter Mage Warlord, just with focus. Oh, and Regalia of the Empire. Okay, so this is interesting. Ah, yes, this is interesting. So, Regalia of the Empire gives Dawnless, which means the regiment can't be broken. If the regiment can't be broken, it can always be healed. Focused obviously makes her a very good healer. This is a Relentless Drill list, and that's a block of nine men-at-arms, with seasoned veteran giving them Bastion. I don't know if this is good. It is very funny. I don't know if it's good, but like... That regiment is is gonna last. It's just gonna it's just gonna energize a bunny its way through engagements. It heals six a turn. Biomancers eat your heart out. The fact that it can never be broken means that if it just gets onto an objective, it's gonna stay there. 
I would love if they had Vanguard, but an Imperial officer has not been selected as the Warlord here. But, like, that's hilarious. That is the far extreme end of the spectrum of, like, putting this woman in a unit of crossbowmen. I am here for it. I, I want to play against it. I, I suspect I won't, because I'm not going to play against Denners in round one, almost certainly, and I don't know if I'll see him for the rest of the event, but... Uh, this is hilarious. Dennis, if you if you listen to this and we get a chance, I want to play against this list at some point. This is awesome. Dove, it's good, but it's awesome. We then have an Imperial Officer with the Gilded Rampart, which gives Iron Discipline, which means you don't lose the Support X rule when you are attacked in the flank and don't reroll successful morale checks when you're attacked in the flank. And he has got Eccentric Fighting Style. I'm going to make an issue about that. That's not where Eccentric Fighting Style should usually be, but okay, it's fine on him. Uh, and Brace for Intact Impact, giving just... Bastion, and no other battlefield drill, uh, <laughs> uh, added to a unit of Steel Legion. Now, okay, he hasn't taken on your uh, on your feet, which would give double time, and he's being put almost certainly in that unit of Steel Legion, but look, the Drill Master in the Steel Legion still gives additional attacks. It's it's fine, right? It's not that bad. It's a, Why would you take that ability if you're not going to use it? Kind of fair enough. We're taking Drill Master here for the extra attacks. Given how big this regiment is, and that it has support too, I kind of question whether or not the Drillmaster and Gilded Rampart in combination wouldn't be better than... There are some really spicy 40-point armor pieces that could go on the Imperial Officer, and which sort of this combination is maybe not making full use of everything that you could take, but this regiment will go quite hard, particularly with the Chapter Mage. This is just two huge bricks fighting in support of one another. We then have two units of Mercenary Crossbowmen, and finally, a Priory Commander Warband. Now, we have a combination that is not super common, but is very solid, which is Long Lineage unlocking Oliphant's Roar on the Priory Commander. Oliphant's Roar gives Glorious Charge, which lets you resolve your impact attacks with plus one Clash, and I think it's plus one Terror? Nope, I was wrong. It's Terror 1, which, if this is going in a unit... In fact, that's not useful. So this is a very expensive way of giving plus one Clash on Charge, on Clash attacks, in, on impact attacks in particular, to one of these regiments, and I question the utility of that. And the reason why I say Terrifying One is never going to matter is that the Priory Commander has Terrifying One, so even if he joins the Ashen Dawn, he's effectively giving the rule to that regiment. Which means that, you know what you could do instead? You could put Eccentric Fighting Style on this guy, and then have like 40 or 50 more points it's very tempting. Oliphant's Roar is the kind of thing that, and look, I would almost never take on these guys because Eccentric Fighting Style is so good. Even if you're taking a Priory Commander of the Sealed Temple, one of my favorite things in the entire game, even on him, I give him Eccentric Fighting Style, not Oliphant's Roar. But it is still going to make for some pretty fearsome impact attacks off of one of those Crimson Tower or the Ashen Dawn regiments. And you know what? Fair enough. We then have Order of the Crimson Tower with Thanabera, Order of the Crimson Tower with Thanabera, and Order of the Ashen Dawn, which means that this army has... One of them has flank, but this is again a four heavy regiments army, but one of them has flank. So we will usually see the Order of the Ashen Dawn and those Steel Legion arrive on turn three, and then maybe one of the Crimson Tower, and then maybe one of the Crimson Tower the next turn. Now... This is going to be very interesting to see, because if those men-at-arms genuinely perform as an anvil, they get into a zone, they pin the enemy in place, and then the Crimson Tower arrive, maybe this will have, like, fantastic moments. And maybe it won't. I'm not 100% sure. That That is such a big men-at-arms regiment. And, like, they're cheap to add, so God only knows how this will go. It is a very, it's a very interesting army. I do have a strong suspicion that if it runs into, like, Dwegorm guns, it's going to get shot to pieces and the Chapter Mage will be overstressed trying to heal everyone. But she can heal people, so maybe that will do it. it if it gets, like, chariots, chariots in the flank are just going to do so much damage if they can make that happen. We will see. I I, I feel like there's, there's an outstanding meme in that Men at Arms regiment, and I'm curious to see if there is more than that. I hope Dinez does well. All right, next faction. We are, I think, more than halfway there now. Thank goodness. Old Dominion. This is the third faction that has five players. Not surprising. So Old Dominion, City States, and Dwegom were the most populous with five players each. Every other faction except Nords had at least some with no Nords in appearance. Now, in the Old Dominion, we are going to see three fallen divinities. We're going to have two other armies. We're going to have one Strategos Warlord, which we can see on screen now. And there's also going to be a Hiliarch Warlord, which we'll see at the end. Notably absent, no Archimandrite Warlords, which is a little bit of a surprise, but I think people have kind of collectively moved away from the Archimandrite a little bit, kind of with good reason. The Archimandrite provides nice, consistent value turn on turn, but ultimately, 
it's kind of very easy to cost and duplicate that value if you are so inclined, and in fact my list does that to an extent. The Archimandrite is an excellent warlord if you are learning the faction or play the faction occasionally, because it will just be consistent. You can just play to what it's trying to do, you can build a list that uses the multiple spells, etc. But it's not a particularly, it's a warlord that I have moved away from as I've learned Old Dominion more and more and more over multiple years now, and I'm not surprised to see it. I would have been, like, I would have expected to see maybe one, but I'm not hugely surprised to see none. So we have actually my list up first. This is the list that I am playing, those who live in death. And this list is notable, among other things, for including both the only Strategos Warlord list, but also Cultists. We have a living unit in Old Dominion. Now, I took a bit of a gamble because Cultist release date was painfully close to the tournament and in particular list submission, but as usual, Parabellum's web store has absolutely delivered, and I think they got the models to me pretty much on release, or maybe a couple of days after. They shipped before release date, or very close to before, and they everything was just very prompt. I've never had a bad experience with the PB web store. They're, they're aggressive with shipping their things out. So we have cultists. Awesome. So what's this list? I can obviously speak ahead of time before looking at this to how this list works. This is a list that is trying very hard to have its cake and eat it too, in terms of all of the things that I like about the Old Dominion, but also the combination of early game power and late game power. And the way that it's trying to do that is to take all of the early game pieces that Old Dominion has now that are kind of strong, and marry them with some genuine ability to reach Dark Power Tier 3 or 4 and to pay off when you get there. So, did it have many heavy stands? No, not really. It has two minimum size heavy regiments. They're fine. But it's got lots of regiments that in some way get more powerful as the game progresses and get more powerful at tier 2 and tier 3 and tier 4, and with the Strategos Supremacy ability, I can spend a lot of time at those levels. In fact, about 4 games out of 5, I will be at Dark Power tier 2 at the beginning of turn 3, or a couple of activations into turn 3, uh, and if I pop the Strategos Supremacy that turn, it can mean that I can spend almost the entire game either effectively at or actually at tier 3 or higher, depending on how many casualties I take. And so even though there aren't many heavy regiments in this list, it's trying to do everything and play all of the parts of the game. But it has to make some concessions to get there, and we'll see those as we go through the list. So we have a Strategos Warlord with just Aventine armor and nothing else. He's going to be in a unit of five Praetorian Guards with Profane Reliquary, which will give the Regiment Aura of Death 2 but without Legio Primogenia, won't get to Aura of Death 4. So this is a Praetorian Guard Regiment with Aura of Death 2. That's nice, it's fine, but if I want to get higher Aura of Death, the only way to get there is with spells from the Archimandrite. Now, in testing, I found that this was fine, right? Aura of Death is, as much as anything, a little bit of a skill test for your opponent. It's not going to be super often that you get to, particularly against skilled players and players who have good strategic foresight, which is one of the primary things that Conquest tests, you are often, if they recognize the threat that all the Aura of Death Regiment charge with Praetorians poses, they will set up countermeasures for it. And so I'm not really trying to lean into this. In fact, neither of my Praetorian Guards have Standard Bearers. This is at least partially because I my modeling restrictions, I have converted my Standard Bearers into Profane Reliquaries. And this is a Parabellum tournament. It's an official event, which means it's subject to all of the usual modeling and conversion rules. Unlike, I would say, most events in Australia outside of the official circuit have adopted much more inclusive modeling and conversion rules. In this case, no, we have to obey the letter of the law, and so I kind of don't have standard bearers for my Praetorians. But I'm also not too down on that, because I want those Praetorian regiments to be holding regiments. They move forward, they hold. I'm going to be spending actions to Bastion more than anything else. Their job is to be, yes, anvils, but they will get to you eventually, they will grind you out eventually. And the thing about Praetorian Guard is, once they get to Clash 3 from being inspired from Dark Power Tier 3, which I will spend an awful lot of time at, they're surprisingly competent combat troops. So, we have Strategos in 5 Praetorian Guard, 3 Legionnaires with Standard Bearer, I think I've actually left the Standard Bearer off of that regiment for some reason, or it hasn't printed out properly, but definitely have a Standard Bearer in that regiment because it costs zero points. Uh, a Hero Deacon with no upgrades in a unit of three Cultists, unit of three Canifors. We then have an Archimandrite with no upgrades, unit of three Karez, second unit of three Karez, five Praetorian Guard with Profane Reliquary, and a unit of three Bone Golems, and then an Archimandrite in Legionnaires. So this is a four character regiment. It has two Archimandrites and a Hero Deacon, and with two Karez, those kind of comprise all of the things that I have access to that give me payoff in the late game. Particularly this Karez and Archimandrites and the Hero Deacon all scale all the way up to Dark Power Tier 4. And you can have situations, and I have had catch situations, where one of those Karez regiments survives to the late game, and I just roll 
surprisingly large number of hits with insanity, and my opponent rolls four sixes and takes 20 wounds. And if that sounds like a negative play experience, you're absolutely right. The swinginess of Karez is kind of just insane with the most recent update, and I'm looking forward to looking forward to Parabellum of changing it at some point in future, because Karez is one of those regiments where when an insanity pops off, nobody is happy. If the opponent rolls zero sixes, the Old Dominion player is like, no, oh, my rule did nothing. And if the opponent rolls any sixes, you have to tell them that that six just dealt four or five wounds, which is, which is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It is incredibly high variance, but even when it rolls average, it feels kind of bad. Nevertheless, this list is very solid. How do you go about beating this list? There are a few ways. Um, one of the ways is to nibble away at all of the pieces that give me payoff into the late game. And one of the ways is just to have a stronger late game than I do. There are some old Dominion lists that I am concerned about because... I have two units of Karez, and Karez are by no means useless in the Old Dominion Mirror, but they aren't quite worth their 160 points. Insanity does nothing unless your opponent has living regiments, and I have the only living regiment of any Old Dominion player, which means that leaves Karez making ranged attacks, maybe making clashes, and casting Drain Will to de debuff defense. Now, debuffing the defense is good against Old Dominion, but it is a flaw in the list, and I'm going to suspect there are, there are some Old Dominion lists that have late game that goes much deeper than mine. I am relying on dark power to get to that point. My opponent has all of the same rubber banding, and they have big, chunky, heavy regiments. So I'm going to kind of be hoping to dodge the other four old Dominion players. And I suspect, in retrospect, that the game plan of be an old Dominion player and dodge the old Dominion mirror is probably not the best plan for winning an event, but I do still suspect the list will perform well. One of the things I could have done is teched really hard for like meta old Dominion lists, and you can do that with things like if you take a unit of Cataphractoi and you give them a Mounted Strategos and Aventine Armor, Scoffnung, and Eternal Discipline, they have that same tech we saw on Hoplites, where Defense 4 in the front with rerolling sixes and ignoring one failed save, they will comfortably tank through the bulk of the damage that Aura of Death from an enemy unit would deal, and then with Scoffnung they will absolutely skewer opposing Praetorian Guard regiments. But then it turns out that there are three uh, Fallen Divinity players which just does not give a fig about kind of cat cataphracts and will cheerfully kill them over the course of a game, and so maybe it's for the best that I didn't do that. Speaking of Fallen Divinity, we have the first of those lists with Daniel H's The Cows list. This is a Fallen Divinity with Aura of Malice, so not Eternal Discipline. We've gone with the 340 point rather than the full 370 point package here. And she will be giving Dread both to herself and everyone within 8 inches. We then have 3 Bocephaloi and 3 Canophores. Then a Hiliarch with Aventine Armor and Semion of the Legion. Got a unit of 3 Legionaries and a unit of five Varangian Guard with Ethan Bearer and a Princeps. This is one of my favorite setups for Varangian Guard. I have run something similar to this, but with even more stands of Varangian Guard, and it is disgustingly resilient. Because Varangian Guard are animate vessels, they have no resolve stat, they have hardened defense three, adding in that defensive tech with both unyielding and hardened, I built this regiment initially into my lists to weather through Dwegom spell firepower at the peak of Dwegom's like, fire sorcerer killingness. And I just kept adding Varangians to the to the regiment each time I played the list until they stopped dying. Uh, and I found that seven was the sweet spot, although Varangians have, of course, since been nerfed, so maybe it would be eight. I need eight stands of Varangian Guard. And that nothing killed that. Nothing killed that, and everything it touched died. Five is the sensible number, and will still do a great deal of damage and still be very durable, and of course opens up points for more other regiments. We've then got a Hero Deacon with Legio Primogenia in a unit of five Legionnaires with Profane Reliquary. Now, yes, this is to an extent the Strategos in his Pro um, Praetorian Guard at home, but you need a Hero Deacon. Like, a Hero Deacon is very, very important to a Fallen Divinity list. And this is a way of spending some points and turning that Hero Deacon's unit into something that's genuinely dangerous. It's going to be Aura of Death 4 with six stands, and, you know, Legionnaires are not that durable, but if the whole regiment dies, you've just gotten six Dark Power, which has catapulted the Divinity up most of a Dark Power tier. This is a unit that the opposing force has to respect, might just run to engage from across the table, and... I actually really like this because I mentioned that Aura of Death, it can be counterplayed against, right? A skilled opponent with good foresight will know how to play against this kind of thing. This is a really cheap, low effort way of getting that Aura of Death 4 threat into a list that provokes that kind of counterplay 
at a much lower cost. And so then you can just play passively with these guys and just wait for an opportunity, which might never arise, but it's causing all sorts of tactical compensations by your opponent. And I have actually played this list once myself against uh, Ewan from Western Australia, and the Legionnaires basically never made contact, but Ewan spent most of the game playing around them because he has that kind of foresight. He's an absolutely outstanding player, comfortably one of the best in Australia, and forcing those tactical concessions from him produced powerful outcomes. We then have three more Legionnaires with the Standard Bearer and three Bucephaloi. Now, for my money, are Bucephaloi as good as Canafors? No. Even with the extra wound, taking him up to wound six, I think there are still a lot of weaknesses in the Bucephaloi profile. It, like, and just playing with them, you look at them and you're like, you, like you put them in play and you're like, oh, they have Unstoppable. That's awesome. And then their impact attacks just don't really do anything. They are, in fact, less dangerous on a march charge than Canafors because Canafors can bless their charge attacks. And then you make a clash and you're like, Oh, they're only they're only clash four, huh? And then you get hit, and you're like, oh, I don't have any hardened, huh? And so we have all of these things that like just kind of, in some respects, just make them feel a little bit worse than the competition. But the models are outstanding, and like they aren't that much more expensive. And unsolvable actually does make a big deal in some situations. And again, I will reiterate, the models are outstanding. Dan has some converted Bucephaloi that are like legionnaires riding Thunder Riders that just look like the Triceratops. It's all Parabellum stuff. It's a legal conversion. It looks wacky as hell, but awesome. And so Dan's decision to run two regiments of Bucephaloi is entirely predicated on that rule of call. Cool. And end of the day, look, if Bucephaloi are really no better than Canophores, but 10 points more expensive, the cost of accommodating that cool in a list is, is 20 points across two regiments. That's quite affordable. Now, this list with a divinity and two units of Bucephaloi and one unit of Canophores and one unit of Varangian Guards with all those force multipliers, this is a late bloomer list. It wants to just bide its time and wait and chill and get dark power and then roll over you. And so it is an example of the kind of list that I am scared of because it's just got more late game than I do. And it's very, very scary. And it's got a divinity in addition to everything. Where this list might struggle is that it has the traditional old Dominion weaknesses. Like before the, the Strategos foot existed, making Praetorian Guard arrive on turn one, you actually had, a, a, you just kind of fell behind on scenario and you had to recover that later in the game. And so really this list has got two notable weaknesses. The first is an opponent that knows how to play efficiently and aggressively into scenario and score a points lead that this list can't recover. And the second weakness is an opponent that doesn't know how to do that, doesn't know how to do anything and just plays slowly so that you don't see turn seven. That is the second significant weakness of this list. Now, Dan is a pretty fast player, but it is something you have to be considerate of when you're playing this kind of list. And also if you're playing against it, you kind of owe it to your opponent to get to turn 10 so that their list can do the thing their list is meant to do. Our second of three Fallen Divinity lists is Conquer Canberra by Dave H. Now, this is an interesting one, but I'm also going to speak very briefly to the player here. Um, Dave is a player who has come into Conquest from, uh, he also and still plays Age of Sigma. And Dave is one of those players where you sit down across the table and you go, oh, Dave, I, I didn't know you were playing Conquest. There goes my win rate, hey? Because he is just very, very good at whatever he puts his mind to. He's one of those war gamers, right? We all know them. We all know people like that, where they just, they'll learn it. It'll take them a little bit to learn it. But as they do, they just get better and better at the game. And they stop making mistakes. And they put together lists that are very, very strong. And this list, this list is kind of like that. This list has just got strength on strength. But then in particular, Dave piloting it is the scary thing. Uh, if I play into this in round one, I might be okay, because I don't know if Dave's brushed the rush off. It's been a little while since he's played uh, since he played Conquest last. He's sort of coming back and doing a whole bunch of painting now. If I play this into this in round four, I'm going to be sweating bullets. We will see. So what is in this list? We have a Hiliarch with Legio Primogenia, Aventine Armor, and Calamitas. A long Legion in order to accommodate all three of those, uh, those upgrades in a unit of Praetorian Guard with a Profane Reliquary. Now, this is a very interesting twist on the Strategos version of this regiment. The Hiliarch is more expensive, uh, and you get kind of a lot of the same stuff, right? You, you, you have Aventine Armor. You don't have Untouchable, but you have Aventine Armor, and you have Aura of Death 4. The difference is the Strategos hits like a wet noodle. He is not really meaningfully different from standard Praetorians. This Hiliarch, particularly if the Divinity is buffing him, has anything up to potentially nine attacks, if she's at full power, with Cleave 2 and Flurry, which means that if you play around this regiment, being able to make aura of death hits, maybe you engage it first, that Hiliarch is just going to clap your cheeks. And so as expensive as this list is, 
is very scary for that reason. And like playing against the Old Dominion, if playing against this with Old Dominion, I I have to either weather the Aura of Death 4, or I have to weather the Heliarch killing me, or dueling me. I can refuse that, but not if I'm broken, etc. Like, this is a scary, expensive, but scary regimen. We then have the Fallen Divinity, and she's got, uh, as opposed to the Aura of Malice, she has Eternal Discipline. This is what you pick, basically, if you maybe are going to expose her a little bit to ranged damage, you're a bit worried about getting spelled or shot off the table. Eternal Discipline will just help make sure that you get to Tier 4, but it's going to be a little bit less powerful once the Lions are joined, because Red is a powerful ability. For my money, I actually prefer Eternal Discipline to Aura of Malice, but it's a stylistic choice. We then have two units of Canifors, and the third warband begins with an Arcan Mandrite with no upgrades. He's packing three Karez just for a little bit of early game poke. You know, just I mean, Karez have a little bit of a flaw in the Fallen Divinity list in that they really like to have high dark power tier. And obviously most of your power tokens will be going toward the Fallen Pantheon tier, but we'll see a list that sort of challenges this next time around. But if you need to, the Archimandrite can use Blasphemous Power to increase the Karez's effective dark power level just for a turn. And I do like having the Archimandrite with the Fallen Divinity because even though he's not going to heal that much, even healing two wounds to a Fallen Divinity deals psychic damage directly to your opponent. So the Archimandra in this case is just in a unit of three Legionnaires. Then we have a Hero Deacon with Devoted to Haslia, just to be really sure to succeed that role whenever it can, in three Legionnaires and three more Canifors. So this is another list with cracking late game. Again, Nothing is going to be arriving on turn one, apart from maybe the Karez, who probably won't want to push forward too aggressively. But your mediums will begin arriving with the Hero Deacon and probably the Praetorian Guard. One thing about this list is that really all of the mediums want to arrive if they can on turn two, because the Hero Deacon can start killing Legionnaires and the Archimandrite can heal them. But regardless, then we have just nine stands of Counterforce plus the Divinity as your power late game. Very solid, very consistent. Everything works very well. There are multiple regiments that punch on very, very well. This is just a good list. This is just a very solid Fallen Divinity list with a light bias toward not trying to complicate things. The only flourish is the Karez, and they are a nice flourish, and otherwise just all of the regiments work as you would expect, Canifors in particular being very consistent thanks to Blessed. Second to last Old Dominion list, we have the third Fallen Divinity list, The, the Adventures of the Angriest Bone Golem by David F. Uh, if you have not seen that Bone Golem, it is wonderful, and I'm sure pictures will emerge of it. It has a big angry face where the usual like Greek art would be. And this list is doing something very interesting. Now, I would not know this if I hadn't asked Dave about this, but this list is actually going to attempt to reach both Dark Power Tier 2 and Fallen Pantheon Tier 3, which is going to be a little bit of a trek, but it is doable, and there's genuine payoff here. We'll get to that. So we have the Fallen Divinity herself with both Aura of Malice and Overkill. Overkill to me says, I had some points spared, and fair enough. We then have a Hiliarch with Legio Primogenia and Eternal Discipline in a unit of five Praetorian Guard with a Profane Reliquary. So, doesn't have Calamitas, doesn't have the extra cleave, doesn't have the extra attack, but otherwise kind of similar effects to what we saw from Dave H's uh, unit of Praetorian Guard. We have the Hiliarch for a Blender Regiment in addition to the Profane Reliquary. Would a Strategos be better, potentially, for the early, like the early scoring and the early pressure, but there is merit to the Hiliarch especially if your focus is on the late game. We then have an Archimandrite with no upgrades. And this is where the list gets particularly spicy, because the Archimandrite is in a regiment of five Legionnaires with a Dark Cenotaph, allowing it to score additional points if it gets onto an objective zone, and two units of four Karez, making this the only player that has more Karez than I do. Now, obviously the Karez like to get as high Dark Power as possible, because right now Insanity scales directly with Dark Power tier. But if you can just get them up to tier two, that's still a pretty big deal. Just being able to spell and barrage or move and spell with full effectiveness, eight dice, goes a very long way in making insanity truly insanely dangerous. And having two of these regiments turn up potentially very early in the game is like, they're, they're, a, they're a counter skirmisher regiment. They are scary. If you need to, you can also have one of the regiments be boosted by the Archimandrite, be giving it blasphemous power for a turn, but I suspect in this case, most of the Archimandrite's time is going to be spent healing back stands that the Hero Deacon kills, because this list is hugely hungry for Dark Power. Because it's trying to get to both Tier 2 Dark Power and Tier 3 Fallen Divinity, it just it just has to generate as much as it can, which means the Archimandrite is probably going to be healing back 
uh, wounds that are caused by the Hero Deacon every round. And then we see the Hero Deacon in a unit of Legionnaires whose job will be to turn up and cast Dark Power and kill its own models as it generates that desperate amount of Dark Power that this list needs. Now, this list is notably different to the other Fallen Divinity list, not just because it has this like flex with, we're going to get all of the Dark Power and we're going to make this work, but it has effectively like one Heavy Regiment. There's Bone Golems in the Archimandrite's Warband. I think I glossed past that, but a unit of four. And otherwise, everything is either medium or arrives as a light or better. The Fallen Divinity is a heavy, but she arrives as if she were a light regiment. Which means that this list is actually on the table very aggressively. Even if it doesn't have a Strategos, it's moving forward and active probably a turn earlier than basically all of the other Old Dominion lists. Now, for my money, this attempt to get to the extra dark power tier, it's a little risky. It's very cool, but it's a little risky. But the payoff versus other Old Dominion list is going to be a challenge. If this list plays into, I think, either of the other Fallen Divinity lists, it's probably not going to go the distance, because as good as all of this stuff is, those Kares are more challenging to use, you're going to be a turn behind on various different things, and those heavies are going to hit this list like a truck of bricks. It's more than anything adapted to fighting other enemy, like other non-Old Dominion lists. This is the kind of list that's frankly a little bit like mine, that you can get when you're testing lists for a tournament, and there just aren't any other Old Dominion players to play against. You do things like you put lots of Kerez in, etc., when maybe we should wean that back a little bit. Nevertheless, very solid list, and I would be shocked if this list didn't rack up at least some solid victories, because it can't possibly play against all four of the Old Dominion players in the event. And any Old Dominion player it doesn't play into, if it just gets that power online, it'll do a lot. Fifth and final Old Dominion list, we have Build Me an Army Worthy of Haslia for Jake M. Uh, and that list title was maybe written by me because I built Jake an Army Worthy of Haslia. Jake is a wonderful, wonderful person who I treasure my friendship with, um, but he doesn't have a lot of time for list construction. He's a very devoted dad. He does get out occasionally to play games, um, but he basically put the flag up and said, can someone help me write a list? I, I've got, this is my stuff. What are we doing? And so this is what he is playing. Uh, this is a pretty tried and tested, and in particular, straightforward list that someone can probably play, especially if they have War Machine, like old school War Machine reflexes, and can think about how a feat turn works. This list is built to play to that, which I pretty much trust Jake to do. Which means we have a Hiliarch Warlord. The Hiliarch Supremacy ability is very, very strong. It gives a clash, a free additional clash to every regiment in his warband. That means you have to build towards it, because you have to build a warband that can fight, and so that's what we're doing here. Now, as is pretty common with lists that I write, we are making some sacrifices to fit in just a little bit more here and there, but the list does so effectively. So what are we running? We're running a Hiliarch Warlord with Aventine Armor for Tenacious and Calamitas to get up to that. Seven attacks with Cleave 2 and Flurry. Three Legionnaires. Four Praetorian Guard. I'd love five, but we couldn't afford it with a Standard Bearer. Just a Standard Bearer. The goal of these things is to carry the Hiliarch onto the field and then let him clash multiple times. He will do the work. They are just wounds to ferry him around. We then have two regiments of four Varangian Guards with Standard Bearers, and these guys, in addition to his feat supremacy ability, will, will do a ton of punching. You can either supremacy for extra threat distance to march, charge, clash, or ideally, you can get in range of the enemy and then charge, clash, clash, and just, if Varangian and guards get to clash twice in a turn, you win the game a lot of the time. They just do so much damage. We then have in Warband 2 a Hero Deacon with two units of Legionnaires, one of which the Hero Deacon is joining, obviously, and three Canifors and three Caryatids. The Caryatids will play around the Praetorians, basically. Maybe they'll walk on in front of them. The Praetorians will leapfrog them in a later turn. Caryatids are just sort of like a nice quality of life unit that also helps with the old Dominion mirror. And also, this list is built around what Jake has. Jake is actually lending me some models already, so we couldn't put things like an Archimandrite into the list, because I don't own two Archimandrites, and I'm borrowing one of Jake's. But Caryatids are just very solid, and it's easy to recommend them, especially if you predict, I didn't, but if we got lucky, a whole bunch of possible Old Dominion mirrors. We then have, and this is genuinely a concession, a Mounted Strategos with a unit of three Cataphractoi with a Standard Bearer. Now, okay, I would... This this is not a terrible combo, but it is expensive. Just taking one Strategos, 100 points for a unit of Cataphractoi, not necessarily ideal. Would an Archimandrite be better here? Yes, quite potentially. Did we have access to an Archimandrite? No, I'm borrowing Jake's Archimandrite so that my army is tournament legal. Because my second Archimandrite is not tournament legal, so I need to have one available just in case that becomes an issue. But 
there's nothing wrong with this. It's not, it's not necessarily how I would immediately build them, but those cataphractoi can and will be a threat. They are scary. They just have to wait. There's no way to easily get them to dark power tier two, where they get memories of old active. The rest of the list has to do the heavy lifting until they are ready. Overall though, there's just a ton of punch here. This is a good solid late game list. It's got plenty of, it's got three, 10, 11 stands of late game regiments, decent middle game, good mediums. It's not on the field too early. We would like a strategos on foot potentially, but we don't need one. This is playing to the late game, we want to generate some dark power, do a little bit of poke with the Caryatids, and then surge in for a knockout punch with the Varangian Guard. Against lists that do a lot of range pressure to us, we'll use the Varangian Guard to march charge clash on the Supremacy turn, and against lists that we are equal on range pressure with because of the Caryatids, we will hope to pull them in and then charge clash clash. And if we do that, we can basically win the game off the back of a couple of charge clash clashes with the Varangians. If not, we'll try and close and do the distance. I am concerned about this list into like Dwegorm in particular, maybe City States Chariots. It doesn't quite have the counter battery fire that it would like into City States Chariots, but anything that it can close with it will destroy and it should play reasonably well for Jake. Up next, Sorcerer Kings. We have two Sorcerer Kings players, uh, and this is the first. This is Michael P playing Penny. Uh, this is a 1,975 point list, which is which is weird. Like surely there's something you could do with those remaining 25 points, but nevertheless, here we are. I'm gonna assume that those that 25 points is really just a model thing. There's only so many models that this player owns, and so they are managing things accordingly. Now, this list is going a little bit off meta and running a Raj Warlord. The reason why I say off meta is that Sorcerer Kings had an update pass quite quickly after release where the amount of administration you had to do for the rituals was toned down, but that kind of inadvertently required you to suddenly take a lot of characters and sort of forced the Maharaja Warlord into most lists since the Raha Ma Maharaja Warlord assists with the load of getting your rituals firing. The Raj doesn't, he gives terror to friendly regiments in range of our objective zone, which is certainly much less complicated to play with, but in the era of Old Dominion Supremacy, I kind of question maybe a little. Nope, still the rest of the list, the rest of the uh, loadout is we have Jadu Kavach. Now, Jadu Kavach is an outstanding ability. It's an artifact that, or patron's gift, an artifact that if you cast a fire spell, it gives every elemental born of fire in your army the ability to reroll sixes to hit, clash or range, whatever. And if you cast an air spell, it does the same thing. Now, often you will plan a list around this, and this list honestly does re read pretty much as, an, as a fire list, but the garage does have the ability to cast both air and fire spells. Now, with Jadu Kavach and so many fire regiments in this list, he will basically always be casting either Molten Blades or Wreathed in Fire, but Molten Blades especially is a very, very good spell. He also has Vizier of the Morning Star, which gives the regiment he is in unyielding, which while it's in a zone, provided it isn't broken, broken prevents enemy regiments in that zone from seizing. Now, it doesn't make you automatically seize the zone if you are, you can get contested out yourself, but enemy regiments can't seize. He will be in a unit of five Regica. These are just very good, solid dudes, especially with the Raj buffing them. They can go a very long way. Uh, you can scale this regiment up like a lot. Five is kind of the minimum sweet spot if you expect to have to fight. You can run small smaller regiments, absolutely. You can run larger. The most I've seen is a, an eight brick with the Raj, also did solid work. We then have four goals. Now with defense one, resolve two, four of these guys are going to be absolute chatter bait, but the offensive output, particularly when you have Jadu Kavach firing, uh, seven attacks, if they're hitting on twos but rerolling sixes, that's a lot of attacks from a regiment that is fast and has vanguard and has unstoppable. So don't underestimate these but they are going to evaporate to the counter swing. It's just that they'll probably do some damage before they go down. We then have a Rakshasa Ravana. Uh, that's the one with Cleave 2. Uh, only 11 attacks. It's the slightly cheaper of the two, and it is a monster hunter. Very dangerous. I like both Rakshasa, but I think I prefer the Bakasura, but not to worry. There is a Bakasura later in the list. We then have a second Raj. This one has Eye of the Blazing Tempest, best money can buy and bound to elements. Now, Eye of the Blazing Tempest, whenever this regiment performs a ritual action or an elemental rites action, sorry, uh, friendly regiments, plural, within with the elemental special rule within eight inches of this character, heal three wounds, and he is going to be in that regiment of Efreet Sword Dancers. Now, Bound to the Elements makes him into a brute. It costs 40 points and has no benefits other than making him a brute, which is shockingly expensive. Like to the point of me being genuinely unsure why this thing doesn't cost 10 points, because you can pay 10 points for a similar ability in other factions that usually comes with benefit. 
But the benefit in this case is the fact that you can chuck a Raj into that unit of Efreet Sword Dancers and then buff them with those spells. Now, six of them is an awful lot. It actually puts you at risk of running afoul of scaling, because I think at that point, once the Raj has joined the regiment, I'm pretty sure once you get to seven stands, you start needing four successes to cast spells. But you take a casualty, you lose a stand, that's fine. At that point, you only need three, and you get a lot of attacks out of those sword dancers. And doing things like giving them Deadly Blades and Cleave is a genuinely pretty impressive Death Star, particularly when we get, and this is how I assume he's going to cast spells, Conflagration. So we will have Conflagration as the most likely ritual, and like that Sorcerer Kings right now, there are many different rituals from which you will select Conflagration. Like, 90% of the time. I would actually be interested in keeping a count over the course of the event as to how many non-conflagration conflagration rituals are started and completed. I would suspect it to be a fairly low number, but conflagration gives you four successes, just to guarantee, which is enough to trigger a spell on this regiment. And so, pretty often we will see an activation pattern where conflagration comes down, and then it's used by this Raj to cast Molten Blades on this regiment, and then you immediately chain into this regiment, which March Charge clashes from way across the field and does just a bajillion damage, because that many attacks with those buffs is very, very strong. It's not even particularly, like, you can't shut that down necessarily either, because three activations, like, we've seen this in Wardroon, you are going to be limited, you can't clash multiple times in a turn, but you can do things like, if you've been flanked, you can reform charge clash, you can reform march charge if you need to, like, the impact attacks are still relatively fearsome. It's just hugely flexible. This is a an offensively oriented Death Star. It costs more than a quarter of the entire list. It's going to draw ritual support as well, but it's very scary. We then have three more of those ghouls and another Rakshasa Bakasura. So this is, sorry, this is the Bakasura. This is the higher attack, lower cleave. 15 attacks with cleave one. This guy is a character hunter. Now, I do really like both of these Rakshasa here. I don't know if it's going to work this way, but I have to imagine that one or more of these will be hanging out kind of within range of the Raj. I have the Blazing Tempest healing those guys up three wounds each time you cast uh, a, a Elemental Rites action is like potentially a lot of healing. It's healing every turn for free, no roll required, you just perform the action which they get to perform for free every turn. If there's a limitation on this, it's the fact that I have the Blazing Tempest is within eight inches of the character stand, and the character stand is going to be surrounded by Jin. So you will have to be, or F8, sorry, so you'll have to be in kind of close order formation, but any benefit there, like potentially onto even one or more like one Rak Rakshasa, even just one Rakshasa getting healing is very cool. We then have a Maharaja with Niantran, Court of Fire, also with Elemental Projection. Sorry, not also with, I was confusing that with Bound to the Elements. Elemental Projection. So, Elemental Projection is the character stand's ability you can increase the range of your spells by three inches, and Niantran allows the Maharaja to be counted as a Wizard 8 and ignore three stands for purposes of scaling, which makes it quite easy to overcome scaling. He is just in a unit of three Rajakar, which means he is purely a support spellcaster. His job is to just walk around and cast his Court of Fire spells, which gives his access to a serviceable offensive spell with Burn to Cinders, and then the ability to grant Aura of Death 2 to uh, a target-friendly regiment. So we could, for example, see that colossal unit of Born of Flame Efreti given Aura of Death 2, or the ability to make enemy regiments not resolve draw events, which in some circumstances can be very, very powerful. But I mostly would expect us to see Wreathed in Flames in particular being cast. With the Born of Elements rule, that's a bit more chip healing. It's going to allow uh, this regiment, this big regiment of... Efreet Sword Dancers to kind of soldier on. Now, ultimately, this is a list that we kind of sort of have seen some similar archetypes, where this is a list that is really throwing an awful lot into a couple of Death Stars. We have that Rajakar with the Raj, we have that huge unit there for Efreet Sword Dancers, and then we have the Rakshasa Bakashura. I think it's probably just diversified enough with those Rakshasa that the fact that it has such an expensive Efreet unit, it can probably get away with, but there are some things missing from this list that I think I would really like. So, for example, we have these units of ghouls, but we don't have a sorceress who would be able to, or sorcerer, sorry, who would be able to make them scoring, which will give you some early game scoring pressure. We're playing paying 25 points down, which we could potentially use that on something somewhere. Maybe cut some points and get an extra stand of Rajakar for the Raj's regiment. I'm sure he has to have those models available because of the way that they, like, there's no way that you could not have one stand of Rajakar in the model collection based on how this has turned out. So it's also relatively low activation count. Only 10 activations up to maybe 11 with rituals is 
it's fine. Like Sorcerer Kings can kind of make that work. It will give them a solid chance to win the initiative roll. But 10 regiments with two light regiments and three characters, we just got a low number of scoring regiments here. We have two Rajukar units, one Efrit Sword Dancer, and two Rakshasa Bakashura. That is five scoring regiments in the entire list. Now, that is not a lot, and in particular, some of them are fragile. The Rajukar are reasonably durable, the smaller Rajukar are not so much, the Efreet are durable, but the Rakshasa and the Efreet and the big Rajukar regiment are all going to be pulled away from objective zones some of the time. They're going to have to leave those spaces. And because goals can't score, they're light, I worry about this list's ability to reliably and consistently score. I think that's something that might cause it trouble. It's also not going to hit rituals incredibly quickly because it's only generating until it gets onto objective zones. And we've just mentioned that it might be forced to leave objective zones. Like it really has to fight over those zones for the actual ritual tokens. It's only going to get there so fast. Overall, I feel like this list is going to be relying on like one big punch with those Efreet Sword Dancers, probably like turn five, where it'll have the rituals online. And we'll have like one big punch with those Efreet Sword Dancers on turn five, and then it really has to do enough damage that the Rakshasa can capitalize and kind of have everything go right. I don't know how well this list will do overall. I don't know how that well this list will do into like the plethora of old Dominion things that we are seeing. I don't know if this list can kill a full-on powered Fallen Divinity. We will have to see. I, I wish it the best, but I'm a bit concerned for this one. Not so much. We have our second Sorcerer Kings list, and here we have an absolute study in contrast. I would like to introduce you to the concept of egregious activation advantage. This is Ewan's list. Ewan from w Australia, Western Australia, one of the best players in Australia, comfortably very, very good. And in this list, we have possibly the highest activation count I think I have ever seen particularly when you account for the rituals that will be going into the list. So what are we running? Well, firstly, we're running a cursed points number with 1990 points, but I'm going to I'm gonna assume that you just couldn't fit any more. We have a Maharaja with Shulat. Now, Shulat, this is Warlord Maharaja. So Warlord Maharaja means that you'll be getting extra, whenever he starts a ritual, you'll be getting extra tokens. No, sorry, I'm wrong. So Elemental Confluence, Remissive Ability. When a friendly character stand performs elemental rites and adds ritual markers to a ritual that's currently being prepared, you may add a ritual marker to another ritual that's currently being prepared. So at a stroke, the uh, the Elemental Confluence ability doubles the amount of tokens you're getting from adding tokens to rituals. And Shulat means that whenever the Maharaja starts a ritual, it starts with extra tokens. So immediately in this package, 140 points, what we are doing is saying we are going to get lots of rituals happening. We are going to play into the advantage that we get from Sorcerer Kings by generating all of these resources. We're going to do that aggressively. And so for that reason, if there is any chance of seeing a non-conflagration ritual cast during the course of this event, it's off the back of Ewan's list, which I would not be surprised if on any given turn we see both conflagration and some other ritual in play, because you can prepare multiple conflagrations, but I don't think you can have multiple conflagrations in one deck at the same time. God knows if that's right, it's changed changed, and blah blah blah, playtest, etc. I'm not 100% sure on that. But there is so much ritual generation potential here that we may see something other than conflagration. So the Maharaja is in a unit of three Rajakar. Then we have a unit of three Steelheart Jinn. This unit size is going to be a bit of a repeating trend. We then have a unit of three Gauls, a unit of three Efreet Sword Dancers, and a unit of three Efreet Sword Dancers. We then have a Sorcerer, Court of Fire with Jadu Kavach. Now, Court of Fire, there are a lot of, there are some wind models, but Jadu Kavach, we are going to be buffing all of the Sword Dancers and all of the Ghouls, letting them reroll sixes to hit. She also, as a Sorcerer, is going to be able to add a scoring to Command Stand, which is going to let those Ghouls score early in the game, as early as, early as turn two. She'll turn up on turn two, be able to make the Ghouls scoring. She's in a unit of three Rajakar, then we have three more goals, then we have three Efreet Flamecasters, then we have three Efreet Flamecasters, then we have three Efreet Sword Dancers, then we have a Court of Fire Maharaja in three Rajakar. So, let's assess. The entire army is light or medium. It has an absolute ton of reinforcement rolls. A lot will be on the field early. And the although we would expect some of those medium regiments not to arrive until turn four, the bulk of the army will be present. And everything will be present by turn four, and much will be present by turn three. In addition, we have 14 activations in the list baseline, which could go up to 15 or 16, depending on how many rituals you have. Now, obviously that gives you an a two in three chance of losing the supremacy roll because their opponent will have a modifier to the die, but Sorcerer Kings are uniquely well positioned to take advantage of having two or three or four uncontested activations at the end of the round. 
This is because of the elemental mechanic. If you know that your opponent will not be able to respond to or punish those last two or three or four activations, and it could literally be, Ewan could have six activations in which his opponent has no response, those can be used to set up surges of power with the elemental rule. Now, those will just be with the Steelheart Jin and the Efreet Sword Dancers. Yes, it's true, right? There's only so much damage a unit of Efreet Sword Dancers will do, but the Steelheart Jin are very dangerous. Even the Efreet Sword Dancers are dangerous when you add in the Jadu Kavach boost, and sheer threat range is going to make things happen. Any of those big elemental units, or those big, as in they are physically large, they are small units, obviously, any of those regiments being able to take three actions has potential significant payoff and huge potential to outplay your opponent. Just being able to do things that your opponent can't respond to is very, very powerful, and this list is built to do that. Now, based on discussions with Ewan, I suspect that he's probably a bit concerned about the Old Dominion matchup, and I, who can blame him? Like, Old Dominion is just very mechanically strong right now, whereas Sorcerer Kings have like plenty of stuff that's going on, but then that stuff delivers 10 hits or 12 hits or 14 hits, which is like dangerous, but into certain Old Dominion things, it's just, it's just not going to connect. If you have a Praetorian Regiment that early in the game has gone to Defense 5, you're just going to struggle to punch through that with a unit of Sword Dancers. You need the Jin, you need the Sorceress giving minor Sorcerer, giving penalty to Defense. If she can do that as Court of Fire, I don't know the faction well enough. There is a risk that sheer mechanical strength overpowers your ability to outplay the opposition. Dwegom also are potentially an interesting matchup. Having all of this interference is very nice against them, but this is not a list that wants to just get shot absolutely to hell by like two Hellbringer Drakes, for example. And if this list plays into something like Alex's double Hellbringer Drake, multiple a fireforged list. The fact that so much of your army is size 2 means you can layer your defenses where you have like warriors or whatever, you can have the um, the berserkers and then fireforged and then the drakes behind them and everything can shoot because it's shooting at size 2 targets and that much force concentration, that much firepower going downrange can take multiple regiments of Efreet off the table in a turn potentially. Or if not then it can, it can break them and badly damage them to the point where that payoff begins to be diminished. Now there is so much going on in Ewan's list that I suspect he has a play for that. He's a ton of scoring. Like everything in the list can potentially score if nothing else. He can, if all else fails, scatter and play this list kind of like Nords, right? Which I know Ewan is capable of. But if there is a weakness in this list, it is just running into sheer mechanical power that doesn't necessarily have a response for. I think Ewan can play around to that. There is nobody at this event running any of the lists we have seen so far that I do not think Ewan can beat, just categorically. His quality as a player, there is no one I would rule him out against. Any games that he loses, I'm honestly inclined to attribute to just mechanical overmatch, and I think he can probably even play around quite a lot of that. Up next, we have our one Spires player. Now, Spires is a faction that we have plenty of those in Canberra. I am a Spires player, for example. I am playing Old Dominion this time around because tournament restrictions in terms of models, mostly. My Spires are very, very heavily converted. But in this case, just one Spires player. Uh, I think that's just a statistical blip. I don't think it's reflective of Spires' strengths. Spires are very, very strong as a faction. Uh, and in this case, we have David S. playing a nice, just solid, sovereign lineage Spires list. So we begin with a High Clone Executor, Marksman variant with Adaptive Sensors and Biotic Hive in a unit of three Marksman clones. Uh, we then have, so that's solid shooting, right? Arcing Fire, just good, solid, powerful shooting at very long range. We then have four Force Grown Drones, it kind of hurts me just seeing that. Like, four Force Grown Drones is not materially different to three Force Grown Drones. There had to have been something you could have used 35 points for. Uh, three Force Grown Drones, three Marksman Clones, which the High Clone will be joining, and then five Brute Drones with Superior Creations. Superior Creations Brute Drones are expensive but very dangerous. Going to Clash 3 with that many attacks and that many impacts in particular and Flurry allows them to do an absolute ton of damage output if they can just connect into something that isn't like Defense 4 with rerolling sixes. Uh, anything that has just regular defensive stats, they do so many hits they can do a lot of damage to. We then, as the Warlord, have the Lineage Highborn, and she is packing the full-on combination of Cascading Degeneration for Aura of Death 4, Theromantic Override for the free out-of-sequence Clash or March, and Venom for Deadly Blades Deadly Shot, and Attracting Pheromones to give her Regiment Flank. 
Now, under normal circumstances, I would very much expect her to see to expect to see her in a regiment of incarnate sentinels. That's pretty standard. But in this case, she'll be joining a unit of five Avatara superior creations, who will get on the board very quickly, and with her in them and superior creations, will be genuinely very dangerous. Like they are expensive, but with aura of death four and that much speed and good defense, etc., just like that's a very solid, well-rounded regiment. We then have a second regiment minimum of Avatara with superior creations and a standard bearer. Two hundred points for these guys. Look, these things are expensive with superior creations. But the regiment can punch on, and it can score, and it is fast. We then have a Siegebreaker Behemoth, and then a big unit of Centaur Avatara with a standard bearer. Now, this list is quintessentially no frills, and it is exactly what David needs to play. David is a paramedic, and his job is very demanding. He doesn't get a ton of time to come out and play games, although I have seen him recently, which is lovely, because he's a truly wonderful person. He does, however, need a list that is not doing all of the freaky and complicated stuff that you can do with ferromancies and biomancies and layering buff and predicting card orders and etc. He needs a list that just every unit does the thing that the unit needs to do, and the closest thing he has to a complicating factor is when to trigger ferromantic override. Everything is solid, everything is well statted, everything will punch on and fight. I don't know if this list will take a fight against, like, Dwegom. It'll probably handle Old Dominion serviceably. Dwegom's spells and shooting are going to make an absolute mess of those Avatara, but the he will march forward with a smile on his face. He will play totally serviceably. This list is well built to just carry on through adverse odds and at least give whoever he's playing against a game. I would say with the level of mechanical strength on offer, he can probably even pull some some he can probably pull some wins with this. And I'm just I'm not trying to denigrate either the list or the player there. I just know that David has a hugely demanding job. I've only seen him out occasionally. I actually really hope that he does well with this event. Um but I do recognize that he's building a list that is intentionally meant to be easy and straightforward to play, and it's one of the strength of Spires that you can do that. I think this is a well-built list in that respect. I hope it will do well for him. Last, but absolutely not least, we have two Wadroon lists. Now, Wadroon were a faction that were hugely popular and played at CanCon, because at CanCon they had access to the full Mantle of the Devoted, Tontor, Thunder Riders, etc. combinations, absolute apex of their power, which has been toned down and those kind of synergies broken up since then. Nevertheless, still a very solid faction, and we have two people playing them at this event. So the first one is Mark W's, and he's playing a Matriarch Queen Warlord, Warband Cult of Death, and she is an Apex Master on an Apex Predator, with her mainstay being three Warbird. Uh, we've then got a Chieftain with Cleave 2, Tribe's Pride, etc. He has Mantle of the Devoted, so this is a fanatic of war, and I'm going to assume that he's going to be in that big block of Braves block, so we have Violence of Action to give them Flurry, Stoic to give them uh, the ability to ignore one failed resolve check each time they're attacked, then six of them with those big war upgrades. It wouldn't be uncommon to see this regiment go like even higher in terms of uh, like the number of models that you put in it, because Braves scale up relatively well. But six is a good solid number with support and plenty of wounds and a champion for extra attacks. And then we've got Flurry from the Chieftain. This is just a nice powerful brick. We then have Veterans, which are very efficiently costed. They're just very solid, well-rounded medium infantry. Standard, a Sander Bearer, which is free, and a champion, which is expensive, but takes them up to attack six, giving them that class three, six attacks, six wounds, defense, resolve three, defense three, thanks to the shield. Just really good, well-rounded medium regiment. We then have three Thunder Riders. Now, these will be War because that's the Chieftain's Cult, so War on Thunder Riders enables them to be quite durable. When they trigger the War Chant, that extra defense goes a long way in terms of making them really tough. We then have a Scion of Conquest. Warband Cult is Death. He has Essence of the Phenopteryx, <laughs> and then Stoic and Focus. So Stoic, obviously very good in terms of helping with Resolve, and Focused, because he's Priest 5, like the Scion of Conquest spells are very solid, and like they're wide-ranging, they do a bunch of different things, but he's only Priest 5. So getting him to, to basically a higher effective Priest level, being able to reroll two dice with Focused, gives him a very high chance of getting those spells off. We then have three Chosen of Conquest and five Blooded, now, my assumption here is that the Scion will be joining the Blooded. This is an Aberration Blooded block with Lethal Demise. That's the maximum size you can have to benefit from the Aberration, but you can add a character into that, and Resolve 4 and Stoic helps really maximize how much you get from Lethal Demise, and having a Cleave 2 unit, a Cleave 2 character into the Regiment, helps diversify its attack profile. 
Now, death, if he triggers it, is going to allow this regiment to get flawless strikes and extra clash. Flawless strikes on this quantity of attacks can be like very, very dangerous, but you do need to get those blooded through. They will obviously, with lethal demise and stoic and high resolve, they will be difficult to kill, but they are still just defense too, so they can take a lot of damage from unexpected sources. Still, overall, particularly with the Matriarch Queen handing out Fnatic, this list has a lot of access to Fnatic, particularly with the Mantle of Devoted. It is playing quite heavily into different Warband cults. So we have we have War from the Chieftain, but he doesn't need many tokens because he's got Mantle of the Devoted, which really reduces the amount of token count you need to get full trigger. And the Veterans won't need many tokens because they trigger them their first tier of their Warcry automatically, thanks to Forged in Battle. And then everything else is Death, so we'll have those Death benefits um, on the Warbread and etc. This is a list that is basically just playing the chant game well and playing the quality unit game well. Interesting to note that the closest thing this list has to like chaff or disposable regiments are just things like the Warbred or the Veterans, which can be like 190 points, 200 points. Those regiments can be used as zone holders if they absolutely need to, or they can be used to kill things. So this is that nice middle ground that Warbred can, that War, War can occupy, where because of the chance and because of the baseline level of quality, Everything is at least a little bit dangerous, and it can become very dangerous. We've got some decent-sized infantry blocks. We've got some solid quality stuff. If this army runs into trouble, again, I suspect it will just be off the back of sheer mechanical power, trying to punch its way through, for example, really high-quality Old Dominion stuff. But it's even got some answers to that. That many attacks off of the Lethal Demise uh, Blooded Regiment with flawless strikes is potentially dangerous even to a Fallen Divinity, for example, and there are a few of those in this event. And with the Matriarch Queen, you have hopefully just enough healing to weather through some chip damage, although the big shooty shots from things like the chariots and from the all of the Dwegom shooting might, particularly given that this list is running either Defense 2 stuff or Defense 2 stuff with shields, Dwegom spellcasting might be a bit of a challenge, and I'm very glad for that reason the list had the Sign of Contra Conquest just for some interference. Finally, last and absolutely not least, we have Hassan running Jolt Hassan B as Wardrun. Uh, and here we have a Scion of Conquest. Again, Death, Essence of the Phenopteryx, Stoic, and One Voice. So I didn't mention this before, but Essence of the Phenopteryx will extend the range significantly of all of the Scions of Conquest spells, which is very nice. And then in this case, One Voice rather than Focused. One Voiced is more expensive and will add a number of dice to the spellcasting roll equal to the number of chant markers in the sequence. So Focus typically is equivalent to getting two extra dice because you can reroll two dice. And if you don't fail enough, you've succeeded the spell. One Voice is going to give you between one and three, or between, yeah, between one and three, because the Scion himself will always add at least one, which means that he is at minimum Priest 5 and could be anything up to Priest 8. Kind of your mileage may vary on which of these is better. Focused is cheaper, but One Voice is sort of equivalently good, if a little variable. Now, in this case, the Scion of Conquest is in a chunky unit of Chosen of Conquest. This is a big, expensive, dangerous unit with absolutely tons of wounds and good stats. And of course, they are Fanatic of Conquest, which is an incredibly powerful ability. Everything we were saying about how Sorcerer Kings could have that surge of power, thanks to the ability to take multiple activations, the Chosen of Conquest just do that as a baseline. It's really good. We then have a shooty predator, and by shooty I mean all predators obviously are shooty, but this guy is running the Slinger Force Multiplication Package. And that means we have, although the Warband Cult is Famine, this is a Mantle of the Devoted Voice of Conquest, which means that he is giving the Conquest Cult to the regiment that he joins, and Fnatic thanks to Mantle of the Devoted, which means again we have that Fnatic of Conquest effect. In this case, the regiment can feasibly take, I think, four actions in a turn, although there are some order of activation issues because he also has Ceaseless Hunt. Now, just to note on this, Ceaseless Hunt is, if this regiment performs a volley action as its second action during the activation, it can make a free additional march immediately after the volley is resolved. Now, this means you can march forward, volley, march backwards, march backwards again, but you can't march forward, aim, volley and march backwards because you won't have met the requirements for fire in advance. Still, it is the potential to take four actions in a turn, and the fact that two of those actions can be to back up means you can move forward six inches, shoot, and move backwards six inches, and slingers, frankly, being volley free, don't, three, don't need to aim that much. We then have a unit of hunters with a flint snapper. Now, this is potentially also another choice for the predator to go in. You could make this choice based on who you are playing against. The flint snapper is particularly valuable against Old Dominion, for example, 
but I suspect most of the time the Predator will be in the Slingers. We'll see, though. We then have a unit of four Blooded with Sandabera and Aberration. Now, it would be very nice to get these guys to five just for the break and shatter math. But look, if you can do 15 wounds to the blooded in one turn, you deserve to shatter them. These guys are obviously chunky. They're dangerous. Defense two, resolve three is not that much, but lethal demise makes this unit all forward gears very dangerous offensively. And with only four of them, they are at least relatively limited cost at only 214 points. We then have slingers to round out the warband and an apex predator as a big monster. The first of, yep, two heavies. We then have a matriarch Queen Warlord. Interesting to see no Chieftain Warlords, but with the break in the Chieftain Supremacy ability no longer affecting everything in the army, I guess it's not hugely surprising. So Matriarch Queen Warlord with Beads of Death and Stoic. Beads of Death will give Tenacious. Wasteland Adder gives, I believe, her regiment flank. So we have Tenacious and Stoic. So Tenacious and Indomitable, which is very, very nice. And she's going to be in a big unit of six Braves. Because she is the Warlord, we can have Fanatic War. So usually she will activate, draw events, she will give those Braves Fanatic War, and then the Braves will activate, and then the Braves will have Fanatic of War, which is a nice buff for a very big or a very solidly sized unit that can then go forth and fight with excellent defensive stats. Finally, we have a second Apex Predator, just as another heavy regiment. Now, this list, kind of similar to the first one, it's fast, it's dangerous, it makes a lot of actions, it does have multiple very expensive characters. Apex Predators are also, while very dangerous, kind of like glass cannons. They don't have the level of resiliency of things like the uh, Iron Drake, the Ironclad Drakes in Twegom. Fewer wounds, no evasion, less dangerous. Not a lot less dangerous, but less dangerous. Of course, they're also cheaper. But we have some very solid, powerful bricks here. The Chosen of Conquest with four of them with seven wounds each. The Blooded, and then of course the Braves with the Matriarch Queen. These are, these are robust regiments that the Matriarch Queen can heal. There's a lot of durability. And we have that early game range presence with the Hunters and the Slingers just to establish a bit of tempo and pressure your opponent into situations where they feel like they have to move forward. They have to aggress into you, which allows you to then maximize the power of these pieces, particularly elements like Anvil-ish elements like the Braves. With Fanatic of War, it should absolutely be noted that those Braves can fight. They can fight their way out of many situations. They're very dangerous but they're also very durable, and the range presence this list has helps maximize the power of that anvil-ish style unit. Bruiser, I would really call them, because they can fight and defend and heal, etc. Having situations where they're not particularly fast, but your opponent must move forward to stop you from continuously shooting them, that's an ideal situation for a regiment like those Braves. Overall, this is a very nice kind of like well-rounded list. Honestly, I have to imagine it's the kind of list that I think the developers probably hoped would emerge when they broke up the like auto-build chieftain list that we saw in kind of like the CanCon period, where it was just like every list, chieftain and tontor and etc. That's not as present anymore, but we are waiting for kind of a Woodrun rework, things like chanting. This is cool. Like, I really like this list, and I think it works quite well. But it works well in that, like, this is a solid B-plus faction running a list that makes good use of their strengths. It is, it is good. I like it. I think Hassan will play well with it. It is a, all right, a Fallen Divinity has reached Tier 3. Can you kill it anymore? Actually, maybe. Like, the, the two Apex Predators... Potentially have <laughs> the potential ability to tag team a divinity, that flint napper regiment, maybe, like she doesn't get to use her hardened, it will actually potentially do some damage. But that kind of situation, right? Where like, okay, look, Old Dominion have had a chance to play their game. It's late in the game. You haven't scored early because there is no early scoring in this list. Old Dominion's actually ahead of you on points because there's a strategos or something. And what now? The Fallen Divinity is at tier three. What do you do? And the answer might be don't let the game reach that point because the mid-game strength of this kind of Wardroon list is strong, right? That window exists where it's like, it's turn three, and we've just had the Sign of Conquest and his regiment move five across the field, and then charge, and then clash, and then wipe a regiment, and then win the Supremacy roll next turn, and do it again, right? That's the kind of opening that has to be made, I think, that mid-game strength, where you have these really good quality mediums, and the heavies who can catch up with the list, I think is how this list is going to win its games. And look, frankly, those Slingers, Old Dominion hate that one trick. I know Slingers technically cause morale, which is wasted against Old Dominion, but just good, high-quality range shots at long range that retreat back out of retaliation range of things like the Karez, just really solid against Old Dominion. 
So there are answers here. It will be down to Hassan to find that window and use them. And it will just be interesting to see if he can find that window or if it closes before he can seize a victory. As far as I know, he's quite a good player. Also a lovely bloke, so good luck to him. And in fact, good luck to everyone who was attending this event. At two hours and 10 minutes, this has been a bit of a video, but I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed going through all of, all of this stuff, looking at everything. We don't get a chance to do this kind of video tremendously often, obviously because there's only so many circumstances where tournament organizers actually gather and release lists. But when they do, it's a lot of fat to chew on and very interesting. So big thanks to the TO Tom for actually gathering all of that, imposing a list deadline, and then publishing everything as soon as everything was released. As I mentioned, the list submission closed on Sunday and everything was up on Monday morning. If you would like to see all of the lists for this event, they have been published. I will put a link to the link in the video description below so you can read along and check things. They'll all be on there either as a mix of PDF or plain text. So you can search through, reconstruct them, think about things as you'd like. As always, if you enjoyed this and would like to support the channel, you can do so via the buy me a coffee link in the video description below or by becoming a channel member. Big thanks to everyone who has so far. I take topic requests from channel members including things like faction focus videos. At some point, I have a request to do a Spires faction focus, and it will be fun to do that. We'll get to that when we get to it, hopefully sometime soon. But I really enjoy Conquest. It's one of the games that I play. And if anyone in the audience who watches this does have faction focus or other topic requests for Conquest as a game and would like to make those requests, please feel free to do so in the comments section below. Otherwise, as always, I hope very much that you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.